Let's try that again. Good morning. That's better. My name is Jen Swisher, and I'm the local lead organizer. On behalf of the organizing team, I would like to welcome you to St. Louis and WordCamp US. Whether you are a designer, a developer, or a content creator, whether you have been working with WordPress for five days or 15 years, there is something at WordCamp US for you. Raise your hand if this is your first ever WordCamp US. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Raise your hand if this is your first ever WordCamp. Equally impressive. Let's give those folks a round of applause. As us long timers know, the WordPress community is first and foremost a community that supports each other. If you are someone who is sitting next to someone who just raised their hand, take a couple seconds and introduce yourself. <laughs> Speaking of community, we are so excited that we have an entire dedicated track to the WordPress community this year. We have sessions on growing your meetup, having a contributor day, working with youth, and embracing diversity. Speaking of diversity, we have a broad spectrum of presenters because diversity makes this community stronger. We have pronouns on our badges because pronouns are important. No matter who you are, where you come from, or what your life experience is, you belong here and we want you here. Now for some practical information. Lunch for all three days will be on the first floor. From the main entrance, you will go down the right hallway past the sponsors hall, and it will be on, in the next hall on your left. Today, we will be featuring a jazz band throughout lunch. This year's attendee social event, formerly known as the After Party, is now called WordFest. It will be held this evening at the City Museum from 7 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. There will be lots of things to do, see, and, well, eat. The City Museum is a fully hands and feet on kind of place. If you would like to climb around, ride the slides, or otherwise run around like a kid at the playground, it is highly recommended that you wear closed toe shoes and long pants. The City Museum is only about a mile away from here, and you can park there for $10 a day right next to the venue. Please note that attendees will need their badge to get in. For our younger attendees who don't have a badge, they will need to enter with their parent or guardian. Please remember to respect our code of conduct during WordCamp. We want this event to be open, inclusive, and welcoming to all people. If you have any questions or you feel you need to speak to someone, please find someone wearing an organizer lanyard. They're black and they say organizer just like this one. Or find a volunteer in a red t-shirt that looks just like this one. And we will be able to help you. Unacceptable behavior will not be tolerated whether by other attendees, organizers, venue staff, sponsors, or other patrons of WordCamp US venues. If you have an issue, we would like to know about it so that we can help. If you have any burning WordPress questions, please visit our support desk. It is located on the first floor in the sponsors hall on the right when you walk in. There will be people there to help you all weekend. All of our tracks this year are on the second floor. If you do end up turned around, find a volunteer or an organizer and we can help you find your way. We are always happy to help. There will be coffee, water, and snacks in the back left corner of the sponsors hall if you need a drink or a bite to hold you over. The WordCamp US swag table is also in the back of the sponsor hall, except it's on the right. Um, and it will open today at 9.30, and, it will al and also tomorrow. And you will be able to pick up your swag at your convenience either today or tomorrow. And last, but most certainly not least, we would like to thank our amazing sponsors, speakers, volunteers, and my fellow organizers for their immense contributions to this event. Without your support and contributions, we would not be able to have this amazing gathering here in St. Louis. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for all you do. And folks, that's really all I have. Have an amazing day.
excited to be in St. Louis this year. Uh, my name is Travis Flayens, and I'm going to be your host up until noon today in this room. Uh, before we start, let's go over a few things. Silence all your devices. I know you all have been to conferences before, and this will be the one that it's you if you don't turn it off. Uh, anybody who's all the way on the aisles over there, please scoot in a little bit so people who are coming in late can grab a seat without having to interrupt people. I'm seeing nobody move who's standing right there on that aisle. I'm not kidding. I will wait. All right. Um, if anybody has any accessibility needs or any additional questions, uh, find a volunteer or an organizer. Volunteers are wearing red shirts like this. Organizers have black lanyards that say organizer on them. Uh, there will be Q&A after each full-length session, so that'll be this one. Please save all your questions to the end, though. Um, and 
for the online streaming and videos, uh, we're going to make sure that you're using a microphone. If at any point you think of a question, feel free to get up and go over to the microphone off over here to your left. Um, and let's see. If you want to, if you want to talk to uh, Tina a little bit more after the session, she'll be around today at least till lunch. So you can grab her in the hallway after the session, so we can make sure we stay on time today. Uh, also, make sure you come to the contributor day tomorrow. Or I'm sorry, that's not tomorrow. Today is Friday, not Saturday. That's Sunday, contributor day, uh, to learn all about how to get involved. And also check out the get involved table in the in the sponsor hall. Uh, Reminder, WordFest is tonight at the City Museum. You need your badge to get in. Um, and if you're a kid, make sure you're with an adult. All right. So our first speaker today is, is Tina Peterson. Session is Creating an Environment of Innovation. Uh, Tina Peterson is the founder and manager at the Sprint Accelerator in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, in her role, she's responsible for outreach products and programs focusing on entrepreneurship and corporate innovation, both regionally and nationally. She also works with corporate leaders on support programs and collaboration efforts. Tina has been an organizer and facilitator with Startup Weekend and worked to create similar format for corporate use. As an active leader in Kansas City, Tina helped to start Athena League, it was on the founding board of Kansas City Women in Tech, interfaces with many KC organizations, and regularly mentors entrepreneurs. Welcome, Tina Peterson. morning, everybody, and thank you for being up here so early. Um, I know just the morning after a holiday, so hopefully you've all recovered from all your sugar eating. Um, so he gave a great intro. Um, that sort of, if you look me up online, it probably says most of that stuff. Uh, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about me, as long as we're kind of talking about community today. Um, so I am... Uh, mixed race Kore Korean American. I was born in the South. I say I was. Gr I grew up in the Midwest, and I became an adult on the East Coast. And now I reside in Kansas City. So I'm back to being a Midwesterner. Um, I'm certified, so I have two degrees: um, um, a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Science. Um, I've never really used <laughs> those degrees directly. Um, but I am a lifelong learner, and so that's sort of how those both came about, um, and I do leverage a lot of that knowledge. Uh, I've um, used that knowledge in more than 20 years of work experience, kind of all over technology, mostly telecom, and then also working with um, young startup founders is the work that I do now. So the reason that I'm giving you some of that background is, again, because we're here as a large community. I, myself, consider myself an introvert. So now that you know a little bit so something about me, when you see me roaming the halls not talking to anybody, you can feel comfortable coming up and saying hello to me um, and starting a conversation. So. Um, so years ago, I actually saw another talk, and I don't know if it was a WordCamp talk or not. Um, and I'm not going to remember the speaker's name, unfortunately, but I will give her credit for this because it has stuck with me for a very long time. And what she said was, when you're giving talks, remember to take credit and give gifts. And so part of what you do when you're giving a talk is sharing your knowledge, right? Um, but also, um, we need to take credit. And so that's part of what I want to do today is share with you that I am the founder of the Sprint Accelerator. And so this journey is sort of that I'm going to share with you today is kind of what we went through as a team, but also what I went through individually as I started pitching and um, building out what happened at the Sprint Accelerator. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so rather than just give you a straight pitch, on um, what the Sprint Accelerator does. I'm going to take you um, a little bit behind the scenes and tell you what that story was. Um, so it really started 
gosh, in 2008 is really where that story starts. And so it's a long one, but um, I'll try and keep it uh, short for this. Um, so in 2008, I think um, I was really just dipping my toe into the water of the Kansas City community as far as what did the tech community look like at the time and what, does, what did the entrepreneurial community look like? Kansas City's timeline of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial community is sort of measured by a pre and post Google Fiber world um, when Google Fiber came to Kansas City um, in 2012. And so I was a little bit on the pre Google Fiber side and it was a much smaller community at that point. Um, we had what is now the Kansas City Tech Council um, that was working under a different brand at the time. We had the Startup Weekend events and um, KC SourceLink and Pipeline and a few other of sort of our larger organizations that still um, exist today. Uh, but other than that, there weren't a ton of organizations. Um, so when I got started, I was really a grassroots organizer in our community. Um, I still had a full-time job and um, I was doing this sort of on my off hours, um, bringing people together. Um, in 2011, roughly, is when I started pitching internal to the Sprint organization, um, which was where I was working full time. And um, this idea that Sprint should be more involved with our community, not less involved. And as um, Kansas City was growing, we needed to be a part of that. And so um, that turned into a volunteer team, and, our, and we got our first executive sponsor in 2012. Um, 2013, um, sorry, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 2013, it was by then it was really my full-time job. This is what I did was try and figure out what the Sprint Accelerator would become, what it would look like. We actually branded it in 2013. Um, and got full buy-in from our then CEO and his executive leadership team. Um, so we were fu fully funded by then. Uh, and in 2014, that's when we really went public. So in January, we opened the doors um, and everybody could come into our physical location we, and we launched our first 90-day program with Techstars. That's where you see most of the news about the Sprint Accelerator is starting in 2014. Um, but obviously, we were working hard on programs and connecting with the community and getting involved pr way prior to that. Um, what you, when we launched our physical location and our brand, um, for me, it was really about how quickly can we actually become part of the ecosystem that is Kansas City and a national brand. And so, um, I think it was in July of that year, um, part of what we did was a lot of give back to our community with physical space um, because we had it for our own programming and as a grassroots organizer I know how sometimes it can be really hard to find a physical location to hold a workshop to give a talk to help your community out and we also know that our grassroots organizers usually are doing this for no pay <laughs> so how could we help and that was one of the easy things we could do um, and I remember somebody coming into our space, I believe it was July, so we're talking about maybe seven months from the time that we opened the doors. And what they said to me really was the thing that I was like, I know we're a success now with our community. And that, and that phrase was, you know what? I can't really remember a time that I wasn't coming to things at the Sprint Accelerator. And so to me, that was a win, that's when I knew we're part of Kansas City, we're part of this community, we're part of how entrepreneurship and innovation happens here in Kansas City. So, um, so that was the biggest win that we kind of got in the early days. We've since had a lot of different wins. Mostly we're known for our 90-day accelerator program that we work with several companies um, and we partner with both Sprint and Dairy Farmers of America. We run their accelerator as well. If you're not familiar with accelerators, they're typically short form programs. They run three to four months and they end in a demo day. Um, through that program, we've now, <coughs> uh, 
we've now worked with 54 founders along with our corporations. Um, those founders have gone on to raise millions of dollars. Many of them are still in business. We have a pretty high success rate and they are still working with our corporations. And so that's the biggest thing that we wanna get from our 90 day program is to create long lasting business partnerships. Um, we've sort of looked under this umbrella. Our vision is how do we accelerate business partnerships, not just so much about a 90 day program for founders. And so we're looking for those unique growth opportunities of how not only young company can scale and grow with large corporations and how we unlock our corporate resources into our environment, but also how do our large corporations get solutions for the innovations that they want very, very quickly, and how can we source those ideas back into large organizations. So that's what we work on every day. We do that through more than just the 90 day program, but that is our flagship program. Um, we have a mentor network. We work with multiple corporations. We also focus on internal innovation and bringing our corporate innovation leaders together to share best practices. In that space, um, of all of the things that we do under our umbrella, we've worked with a little over 40 corporations and I think over 200 founders at this point. So um, we stay pretty busy and we're a really small team of people. We're only three full-time people, um, but the way we get it done, again, it all circles back around to our community. And as you guys know, as being part of WordPress, it's not just a Kansas City community or a national community, but a global community of people that help us get where we are. So we certainly can't do it um, all ourselves. Obviously, our corporate partners help us quite a bit with content and expertise, um, but we also rely on the larger ecosystem um, to bring in knowledge, past founders who come back and talk, um, founders that haven't worked with us but are still working and still want to give back to their communities. And so we convene a lot of different people to share their ideas and help grow companies, push innovation to the next level um, and keep things moving along. So uh, I think that I'm skipping over a, cu a couple things, um, but uh, I know that I promised <laughs> that I would give, um, give you the sort of the formula for innovation before I closed out my talk today, so I'm gonna make sure that I do that. And I did not write this formula, but I do think that it, it uh, speaks well to how we work and what we deliver on. So it was James Dyson who actually said this, and um, everybody's looking for that magic formula. So here it is, creativity plus iterative development equals innovation. Um, and so innovation tends to be a buzzword, but what does it mean? And that's really a definition that you have to come to yourself. Um, and there's lots of ways to get to a finished product, um, but we all get there through multiple changes, changes over time, help with community members um, that help us challenge our thinking um, and try new things. So hopefully we can do a little bit of that over the next few days as you guys share and learn and get to know each other. Um, I'm gonna leave it there, but I think there's gonna be some QA if anybody has any questions for me. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, come right over here to the, whoa. Right over here <laughs> uh, to the side of the stage. Uh, I wanna personally say thank you, Tina, because in Kansas City, I'm one of the organizers of the WordCamp in Kansas City, and for the first few years I was involved on the team, the Sprint Accelerated donated space for us to host part of our WordCamp, so thank you very much for that, Tina. Um, does anybody have any questions? I can bring a mic to you if you're just lazy. All right, well, everybody say thank you to Tina, and if you, oh, oh, wait, we got one, we got one. All right, my name is Todd Fleming from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I have a question. So if someone is looking for, a, um, for an accelerator, 
I guess, what advice would you give them in terms of trying to identify like, the criteria that would match, I guess, the startup that they have? That's a great question. There are hundreds of accelerators throughout the world, um, and there's lots of different formats. So specifically with the DFA Accelerator and the Sprint Accelerator, we're looking for strategic alignment. So we're pretty specific on what we're looking for. Um, I think founders should be just as specific to what they're looking for. Um, you're going to be giving a lot of time to an accelerator program, uh, even 90 days, like 90 days dedicated to any type of program and accelerators are pretty intense. Um, you should know what you want to get out of an accelerator before you go into it, and you should really spend some time understanding what the program is that you're applying for. Um, there, there's a match out there for any business and for sort of anything um, that you're looking for as far as an outcome goes. Uh, and ask questions. Don't just accept that they're, they're going to make it right for you, um, but ask questions and know what you want to get out of it. Hi, uh, since we're streaming online, I have an online question. Um, the person that submitted the question wanted to know what challenges did you face in developing the Sprint Accelerator? So many. I, I think we could do a whole other talk probably on that. Um, so the biggest challenge is really trying to get a large organization um, like Sprint or Dairy Farmers of America or name a big company in your city, really, to understand this idea of what is an accelerator. It's becoming more well-known now, but when we were pitching it in 2012, um, there weren't a lot of corporations that were really doing this type of thing. And so our biggest hurdle was trying to explain that. Um, and once we were able to explain uh, what the format was and why it was um, a good idea, <laughs> um, then it was a lot easier. But it definitely takes some time as far as the education piece goes, for sure. Uh, I was curious about the part, I think you mentioned, you know, mostly you work with founders and startups, but you also mentioned that you work with over 40 corporations, right? Like existing corporations. Yeah. Um, so I was curious, I guess this might be like a two-part question. I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> if not, that's cool. Um, but I was curious on like working with both founders at a startup level and then existing corporations. Is there, was there a lot of overlap in between on what you actually did with them, I guess, and like what you would look at to create innovation with them? Um, like were they similar or different in certain ways? And also I was curious on like the corporate level for existing corporations, how do you, um, how would you bring innovation to them that you know might be in a entrenched industry or like a industry for a long time or been around for a long time? Great questions. I'll try and remember them both as I start to answer. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between uh, corporations and the startup founders. The biggest difference is size, really. I mean, they're both in business. Uh, so, so what they're trying to achieve as far as business growth, um, acquiring customers, sales channels, marketing, development, um, new products, those things align um, pretty, pretty well. Um, and again, what you're dealing with is size and capacity when you're talking about a corporation. Um, when you, you say entrenched, um, when you think of large corporations, I think they're all sort of entrenched, right? Like, that's how they got so big. Um, it's always a challenge. So ch changing um, a company culture is, is a big challenge. Part of what we do, um, again, with the 90-day program is how do you find external innovations that you need inside of a large organization to help you grow and bring them in. Um, we're also looking at programming for internal ideas and how do you get those commercialized out when, the, when they're sort of on the edge of the large corporation. Um, that's a tricky piece, 
um, because of IP and ownership and risk uh, to a large corporation. Um, but then the other piece is leadership development, and that's been a, a key focus for one of our team members over the last couple of years, uh, and that is integral in sort of how both of those innovation pieces come together, right? So it takes a different type of SAMA and leadership um, to drive these ideas forward, whether they're external to a large organization or internal to a large organization. So how do we support those leaders as they grow um, and continue to sort of um, fight the status quo, so to speak? And so that's what we look at. We have three main areas, um, and we kind of cut across all three of those. I wouldn't say we have lots of areas that we still need to grow in and improve on um, and iterate <laughs> um, to the innovation um, formula, but you know, we, we keep working at it every day just like our founders and leaders do. Thank you very much, Tina. Thank you, everybody.
Welcome to WordCamp US 2019. How was your first session of the day? Got some thumbs up, some claps, that's good, right? Um, my name is Travis Flans. I will be your host in this room until lunch today. Um, Got to go over a couple things with you. I'm sure you already heard them. Silence all your cell phones and devices. You've all been to conferences before. If you haven't been that person, don't let it happen today. Um, anybody who's in that far back corner, make sure that you give a couple seats next to the aisle so anybody who comes in late doesn't disturb people trying to find a seat. Um, here we go, let's see. If you have any accessibility needs or questions of any sort, find anybody wearing a volunteer shirt or anybody with a black lanyard. Those are your organizers. The red shirts are volunteers. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A after this session. Uh, we've set up microphones in the front corners, so please make your way to those microphones. Anytime that you have a question, feel free to get up and get in line over there. Uh, we do need all questions to go through the microphone for the live streaming. Um, and if you would like to speak with our presenters uh, in, in length, uh, wait till the session's over. Uh, so keep your questions short and concise. Um, unless there aren't a lot of questions, we can go a little more in depth in that case. And let's see what else we have. Uh, everyone, please come to the Contributor Today on Sunday. If you've never been to a Contributor Today and want to know what it's all about, visit the Get Involved table in the Sponsor Hall. Uh, contributor Today is all about how to get involved with the WordPress program uh, in your community or online. Uh, let's see, reminder, WordFest party is tonight at the City Museum at 7. You do need your badge. If you're a kid, you have to come with an adult, so uh, don't just ditch your parents and come. And so, uh, welcome to our 10 a.m. session, open source, open process, open web, with Helen Husande. Uh, Helen is a director of open source initiatives at 10up and a WordPress lead developer. She shapes products, UX, and engineering within the realm of open source and open communities. Welcome, Helen. All right. This is an intimidatingly large room, so it like looks empty. So I'm relying on people to nod and make me feel like I'm, I'm doing good here. All right. So um, he introduced me. Um, so yes, I'm Helen. Um, I am here from San Jose, Costa Rica, which is where I live. Um, I am otherwise a New Yorker slash Virginian, which is why I sound the way that I do. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about today, um, there was a talk right before this actually, I think over in room 230, um, about WordPress and the open web and it being a platform for building on and for the open web. Um, so we're going to build on that kind of topic a little bit and talk about uh, the history of open source. What does open source even mean? Um, what, what does it mean to have an open process, right? Why is, is open source good enough or do we need to have an open process on top of that? And then how is all of that in support of an open web? So we'll get right into it. Um, I am not a history lecturer, so uh, I apologize if I say something that is not uh, completely accurate. And I think also there are a lot of different definitions and takes on what is open source in the first place. Um, I will talk about a couple of those uh, in this talk, but we may disagree and that's also completely fine. Um, you just probably don't need to berate me about it uh, on mic here, but we can, we can definitely disagree and talk about it. Um, so, what is open source? I think that if you're here at WordCamp and you're here at this talk, as opposed to a couple of the other ones, um, you probably have somewhat more knowledge of what these things are. Uh, but as I said, you know, there are different viewpoints on this, um, so I want us to at least get on the same page for the purposes of this talk. This is the open source initiatives definition of open source. Um, open source doesn't just mean access to the source code um, and that the license must not discriminate against any person or group of persons or restrict anyone from making use of the program in a specific field of endeavor. Um, I, I don't know how to make that clear, but it's basically, it's accessible to everyone. This is the Free Software Foundation's definition of free software, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you might have seen this before. This is on the WordPress credits screen. Well, there's, there's an about page, a credit screen, and a freedom screen. Um, so these are the four freedoms, and they are numbered from zero on purpose, so you'll hear people talking about like freedom zero, freedom one, um, and so they, they are numbered specifically this way. 
Um, so zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. So that reflects what we just saw from the OSI. Um, freedom one is the freedom to study how the program works and change it. Um, and that covers a lot of what we do uh, in working on WordPress itself, right? Is that we, anybody can come in and think, you know, uh, I think that this would be a meaningful change for WordPress and can give it back and should give it back. Uh, freedom two is the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. Um, freedom three, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to other. Uh, and a thing we frequently hear is that we're talking about free as in speech, not as in beer. Um, and so this is a terminology and language issue uh, where free can mean multiple things, right? So there's free as in it doesn't have a price, and that does happen to be true for WordPress um, and a lot of things surrounding WordPress. Uh, but when we talk about free software, we're talking about free as in freedom, that you are free to do X thing, that you are free to do Y thing. Um, and so when we think about uh, these four freedoms and we think about free software, the free software movement uh, focuses on not just giving you these freedoms, but protecting these freedoms. And so when we talk about the WordPress license and the GPL, uh, that is a, a format, you know, a formalization of um, protecting these freedoms, saying that it isn't just that you are free to redistribute these copies when you've modified them, but that you are required to so that everybody else can continue to learn from them. Look, everybody, I'm meaning. <laughs> um, this is my first ever funny slide, I think, in a talk. Um, I'm just, it's just kind of, I just never put them. Um, so this is, I think, something that's really important to, to talk about when we talk about free versus open source software. Um, they actually are two separate concepts, and they come from different backgrounds, different people, interesting people um, <laughs> in the history of open source. Uh, but free software is itself a political movement. And so we hear sometimes when we're working on software, why do you have to make everything political? This should not be political, right? But it is by definition politics. There is the practical aspect of actually working on a project as large as WordPress, which is that you are working on an open community public good in public, right? Is that not what politicians do? Um, but, you know, more fundamentally, the free software movement is about politics. It is about taking the power from corporations, right, at that point in history where they were, um, I'm not sure that they foresaw Microsoft being on GitHub with a bunch of repos, um, but at that point in time, um, the intention was to take the power that had really consolidated with a few corporations, something I think we're seeing again today, um, and bring that back to the user. Um, and I think that some of that also gets lost, especially when we talk about it in the framework of WordPress, because of, again, different definitions for the same word, right, where a user when we talk about users in WordPress land, we're frequently referring to end users, right? The people who are sitting at the computer, you know, using whatever interaction device to use WordPress itself. And that's what we think about when we think about users in the WordPress context. But in the software context, when we talk about user freedoms, about bringing power back to the users, the user is anybody who is interacting with your software in any way, whether that's downloading it, whether that's modifying it, whether that's developing with it or for it, right? Those are all users, those are all different types of users. But when we talk about free software, they don't distinguish between different groups, right? Everybody in those groups is a user, and that's what we mean when we talk about user freedoms. It is for everybody, right? So when we think about licensing, when we think about the GPL, and why does WordPress love it so much, um, and why do we have policies like at WordCamps around making sure that we are upholding not just the law of the GPL, the letter of the GPL, but also the spirit of it. And it's important because it protects the users, right? And we're not talking about, again, we're not just talking about people who are directly interacting with the WordPress UI. We're talking about anybody who might want to change something about WordPress, right? And for the rest of us who are also working on WordPress, we don't want them to take their changes that could be improvements and keep them to themselves and a profit off of them and to take that power and take it away from us as a community and put it back in the hands of a large business or a corporation or somebody else, right? We want all of that knowledge and all of that power to continue to be shared in the community. Um, and that's what is so important about something like the GPL. Whether you 
like it as a license or not, right? Um, that's, that's okay, we can disagree about that again. Um, but that is what is so fundamentally important about the GPL and WordPress and that relationship. Um, and it is also codified in the law of the license in that if you make something that derives from WordPress directly, um, you know, we could challenge what does it mean to derive meaningfully and direct directly. Um, but if you do, you must inherit the license so that it continues into the future and we can all continue to spread our knowledge. So WordPress, the WordPress project, what we're all here about. Um, WordPress is more than just an open source project, right? It is a project with an open process. So it is extremely possible for a project to be open source, to have its source code available, to be allowed to remix it, to do things with it, but to not have the actual process of developing that piece of software be open. Um, and I think that's something that is really amazing about WordPress. Um, I went to my first WordCamp almost 10 years ago, um, and it was, to me at least, it was an expression of that open process. Right, where it, where it wasn't just a bunch of people who made WordPress behind the scenes, but instead they were coming together at a conference with hundreds or sometimes even thousands of people and talking about not just what they're doing with WordPress, but what they're doing to make WordPress better in the future. And I thought that, that was super cool and something that I wanted to be a part of, and so here I am. Um, I've actually been at TenUp for eight years, uh, which is a very long time to be at any company, um, but especially in the tech space. Um, so. I think there's, I don't want to get too deep into it. There are a lot of talks, including right now, one of my coworkers at the same time talking about uh, contributing to WordPress. Um, and as, as, uh, as was mentioned, there is a contributor day on Sunday, which is really great to go to, even if you feel like I don't know how to code. Um, there are lots of different ways to give back to a project, um, documentation, translations, all of that. That is all part of having an open process um, where anybody can participate. Um, and I think it's uh, an important goal to have to keep that process open and to continue making it more open, right? To find avenues for different people to participate um, more than just is my software accessible, but also is the process of making my software accessible to many. This was something I saw recently that is um, very pointed <laughs> in the way that it's phrased, um, but I thought that it was, it was a good way to think about it. Um, and this is, Stop treating open source like a product you purchased and start treating it like a team you belong to. This goes back again to the, to the underpinnings of free software, right? Where we have taken the, the ownership of this product somewhat away from companies. I mean, we, we, don't, we have sponsorships and that sort of thing, but really the, the ownership of it is community-based, right? And therefore it is a team that we all belong to. We may not actively participate in that team. We may not want to be a part of that team, but once you're participating, once you're using um, open source software, you are a part of that team, right? Testers are a part of that team, and if you're using WordPress, you're testing it, because you're probably finding bugs or things that uh, could be better about WordPress. Um, I, have to, I have to plug this. <laughs> We, we've been putting together a set of open source best practices um, at 10UP. Um, I'm a director there. Uh, and so this is a lot about the process. So some about the philosophy behind it, but a lot about how we actually execute on that process. Um, and I think that that's something that I would like to see more of um, across not just the WordPress space, but across uh, tech in general. It's like, how do we approach open source? How do we think about having an open process as an important part um, of having open source, right? Because we have a lot of large companies, and we could do this at TenUp too, right? We, we could just have these things where you can have the code and you could do stuff with it, but we don't actually welcome people into participating um, in our projects. And that's not what we want. We want to be very deliberate about including people and saying, this is how you can participate. These are ways that you might be able to do it. These are the ways we expect things to be phrased. These are the ways we expect people to communicate with each other in a respectful and timely manner. Um, and so we've put this together as well, um, which hopefully will make for some interesting reading for people. Um, it is also a living document, and it is an open source project. So if you have things that you think uh, could improve it, or you find a typo or whatever, um, we are also happy to take your reports of things that uh, could be improved there. So, moving on to what is the open web? 
Um, I asked this question, what, what does the open web mean to you? I asked this question on our favorite bird website um, a while back, and I don't think a single person agreed on what it means. Um, and that's, it's fascinating to me. If you ask me what I think the open web means, I don't think that I could tell you, um, because it means like a thousand different things and almost nothing at the same time. Um, but uh, we should still talk about it. So talking about the open web, here are some common terms that come up in the WordPress context around the open web. Uh, so RSS and now APIs, so like the REST API, um, public access to that. Uh, pingbacks and trackbacks, very contentious, but uh, interesting things, important things. Um, exporting and being self-hosted. Um, so why are these things a part of the open web? And why do we talk about these as, as like fundamentals of how WordPress um, as a piece of software has APIs that interact and support the open web? Um, so these are things that are openly available as a part of the software, right? So RSS feeds are public. Um, some of the JSON REST API, right? Like you can't like make new posts, but you can like see the latest set of posts publicly in the REST API on a site. Um, this is a way for anybody to be able to interact with your site, right? So like an RSS reader, again, this takes the power away from the website serving the content, right? It takes the power away from their advertising model, it takes the power away from how they've decided to present that content, and it puts that power back in your hands as the reader, where you can ingest that content and read it the way that you want to in a way that makes sense for you, right? These, these concepts are very, very similar, um, as you'll see, between open source software and the open web. Um, pingbacks and trackbacks are ways of connecting content between sites. Um, they've, they've become, I think, a little more contentious in the way that people think about them, especially in recent years with the uptick of spam and abuse um, of these features. Um, but they are extremely interesting ways of being able to alert somebody that somebody else is talking about your content, right? Somebody else has decided to send a track back to you to let you know that they have linked to your site and something that they're talking about. Um, and this, this comes up a lot when we think about what would it be like if we had social media that was not a single large company, right? What if we had something that was what we call federated? Um, I don't know for how many people that word is meaningful, um, but w what would it mean to have like a federated social media network where the power of ownership of your content does not lie with a single company, but rather lies with you. And we tie each of your individual instances of your content together in some way. And that's what pingbacks and trackbacks were meant to be. And I think that's something that would be really nice to revisit um, in the context of really now thinking about what we know about bad actors and how could we design these in a way to make it useful for connecting people's sites, for connecting people's content. Um, without centralizing uh, the storage of that. Um, exporting your content, also very important uh, so that you are not tied to that piece of software, right? Let's say, let's say WordPress went rogue somehow. Somebody took control of it and did something bad and you don't like it anymore. Um, you can export your content. Hopefully they will not have turned that off at that point, uh, but you should be able to export your content at any time and take that somewhere else. Your, the content is yours and it should be portable. Um, and this, this also ties into being self-hosted, which is that you know, we should reduce barriers to using the software by providing things like hosted versions and whatever, um, but the ability to run that software on your own should you choose to is also very important. The web itself is also built on top of a lot of things that we call open web technologies. Um, so this also kind of mixes up terminology a bit. Um, these are ones that are very common in the WordPress space, right? HTML, CSS, JavaScript, very common across the web broadly, and then PHP and uh, SQL as well are open technologies. This does not necessarily mean that they are open source, right? So for instance, CSS itself doesn't have a source per se, um, but what it does have is it has a spec and it has an open process that you can observe and somewhat participate in. Um, and so we call that an open technology because it is developed in the open, right? The things surrounding it. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of the browsers where the CSS is interpreted, right, a rendering engine, 
a lot of those now are also op both open source um, and with an open process. So these technologies, um, we, you know, we like to think about like what are the, the open web and we use open technologies, but I really want us to take a step back and now think about what got you into web development in the first place. So take a second and think about what was the first time you did something with HTML? This, this is gonna date me, I guess, and now you'll be able to guess how old I am. Um, for me, my, my first real memory of messing with HTML was my AIM profile, <laughs> which had a one KB limit, and I wanted to squeeze as much in there as possible as a teen girl. So I went in and found out that a lot of colors could be represented with three characters in the hex code instead of six, therefore saving me characters and I could add just like one more lyric to my profile or whatever. Um, that's really my first memory of, of doing something with like a, an open web technology. I didn't think of it as an open web technology. I don't think, I probably would have laughed at you if you told me that was what I was doing. Um, but it was, it makes me think a lot about why we do what we're doing, right? Why do we stay doing these things? And it's not really about the technology, or hopefully it's not really about the technology. It's about what we can do with the technology, what we can accomplish with it, um, whether that seems like something that's silly now in hindsight or something that is extremely meaningful. But what I want us to think about more and more it's not just, you know, what technologies am I using? Is it the latest and greatest? Is it something super open? But what are we doing with that technology? And how are we sharing that knowledge back with people, even if we're not compelled to by licensing, right? Um, there's a tool that's super cool uh, now that's called Glitch. I don't know how many of you, has anybody heard of Glitch in this room? Oh, that's more than I was expecting, actually. Um, so it's, it's got this very, like, GeoCities aesthetic, which obviously I love. Um, but uh, it's, it's this like open playground for code um, and for modern web applications where you have your source code and you can edit it and you get like an actual instance of that code running spun up that anybody can see, but also anybody can see that code that you've put up and they can do what's called remixing it where they can take that project of yours and do something else cool with it and extend it or make it do something else. Um, and that's something that I think is really cool. So like the glitch product itself, I don't know how much of that part is open sourced, but the fact that it is supporting that kind of knowledge sharing um, is something that's really cool. And so that's where we can see that intersection of like, yeah, we have a product, we have a company, right, that's built on top of something, but we're still supporting this knowledge sharing, this bringing the power back to our users. Okay, so I wanna go back now to these four freedoms um, and, and how we think about these freedoms. Um, and how we think about them as licensing for software. Okay, so again, the four freedoms, I'm not gonna read them out again. And then these common things that we think, think about in terms of supporting uh, the open web. Now here are some other things in the WordPress space uh, that I think are in support of those goals of user freedom. Um, and not from a licensing perspective um, but from a support of the open web perspective, right, where we take those user freedoms and we support both the spirit of the GPL and also that user freedom that, uh, that the GPL is about in the first place and that open web. Um, backwards compatibility, everybody's favorite topic. That's not true, the second one is everybody's favorite topic. Backwards compatibility, um, important here, right, because if we keep breaking things, what happens to sites? What happens to that content, right? If we don't maintain compatibility, especially in certain aspects of WordPress around, let's say, APIs or RSS, right? Um, what happens to people's content if they stop maintaining their sites? But we still want their content out there, right? We still wanna have that out there. Um, we still want that as part of the web um, and to be able to continue to access it. Uh, and that also ties into things like security updates or auto updates, which you can debate about tomorrow with the panel. Um, and again, how do we keep sites online? How do we keep that content available? Because our priority is not the technology underneath it, right? The priority is the content and the experience of creating that content and, and uh, consuming that content. 
right? And so when we think about what are our priorities and how do we support the open web, it is having that content continue to be available, continue to be able to create that content and to consume it um, that is more important than the actual technology itself. Uh, accessibility uh, in all manners, uh, which is also related, very tightly related to adaptive design. Uh, and this is making sure that the software and the content and everything related to it is available to all. And we really mean all. We don't mean most people in most circumstances, we mean all, right? And so how do we continue to make gains on that front uh, to support user freedom? And then finally, a low barrier of entry. So we talk about you know, easy installs and you know, availability of the software and the size of the software that you're downloading and everything. Um, and that's also a part of maintaining that user freedom so that you are able to be a part of it and to really feel like you're a part of it. This is something I saw not long ago. There's dates, it was about six weeks ago, um, that really, really summarized the way that I've been thinking about these things recently. Um, and that, again, you may not agree, and that's okay, but I think is a really, a really good thing to internalize and think about. Um, and I will read it. So user freedom requires more than the four freedoms. It requires marginalized users having a say in the software, being able to customize it to better meet their needs, regardless of their technical ability. It requires software that serves the needs of humanity, not the rich. So if we go back to this definition of open source, so now I'm gonna tell you that I actually don't like this definition of open source. And the reason why I don't like it is because it only talks about the license, right? The license must not discriminate against any person or a group of persons or restrict anyone from making use of the program. I think it makes sense to dial in what you're focusing on at any given moment, right? But to me, the definition of open source has to go beyond this. It has to go beyond what does the license permit or not permit. Um, and in the open source sense, it probably is going to continue to permit a lot of things we probably don't want it to permit, right? WordPress is being used for lots of things that I personally would really rather not be used for, but that, that would violate the spirit of open source if I said you cannot use it because you're a jerk, right? That's not how open source works. Um, but open source includes open processes, right? And that's why things like having a code of conduct and the values that your code of conduct are protecting, why that's so important. Because we cannot have open source software and we cannot have open communities if we don't really think about who do we want this to be for? Do we really mean everybody? And how do we protect that? And how do we prove that? and how do we execute on that as we create the software. This is something that I saw recently. Again, everything is very recent um, in my mind. Um, this is something that I saw recently about open source that really, really reminded me of why this is so exciting for me, why open source continues to be exciting, um, why it continues to be such an amazing place to work in and space to be in, whether it's WordPress or not. Uh, but just directly interacting in open source software um, and, and the open source you know, philosophies. Um, and so this is, this is it's a, on medium, of course, um, but it, it's a piece from um, somebody about a project that they call the Lydian Accelerator. Um, and it is about genetic mutations and open sourcing a database around creating um, individualized treatments for individual genetic mutations um, in order to hopefully save their baby and then millions of others into the future. I encourage you to go look it up and read the whole thing. Um, this is a paragraph from it. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But what I thought was really important, and this is, again, really highlighting the open source nature of it and what they intend for this project to be, which again is not for something for pharmaceutical companies to own and to attempt to profit off of, which is why these treatments probably don't exist in the first place, right? To have these kind of individualized treatments is not a profitable, marketable thing. Um, but rather they're, they're making it, again, bringing the power back to the users, in this case, the parents and the physicians associated with the parents. Um, so they're talking about N of ones, um, this is, this is the, the individualized treatment that they're talking about. 
But anybody performing an N of 1 should be able to tap into this repository, um, this centralized database of information about treatments, how they've worked, how they haven't worked, um, efficacy, all of that, um, as long as they contribute back to it. And I think that that's an amazing thing. Um, and I really hope that this is something that is successful. I'm going to continue following along with it. Um, but it does remind me that, you know, as we're working on the software and all of that, you know, which I also do, uh, we still have to think about making our software, uh, making our open source, open processes for humans, right? What are we enabling as we continue to work on these projects? Um, what, what do we want to enable, right? How could we design our software? How could we design licenses? How could we design uh, codes of conduct? How could we design events? How could we design anything surrounding our open source projects um, to really make it about humans, to think about what we want to enable, to think about what we could enable, um, and the cool things that people might be able to do for the betterment of everybody else. And that's it for me. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please come to the front corners of the seating area. I don't know what kind of questions people will have, so this is actually the part I'm <coughs> most afraid of. I'm curious, uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on the Hippocratic license and other do no harm licenses and what our responsibilities, if any, are as developers to ensure our code doesn't get used for. Yeah. Um, okay, so there, there's, so for some background on this, um, this is actually, I think it's a topic that's been around for a long time. I don't know that I've kept up with it over a long period of time, um, but there's the concept of licenses that, that explicitly say do, do no harm, right? So there's one, I think it's called the Hippocratic License, right? That's, um, I think it's like do no harm.dev, I think is the, the domain for it. Um, where it explicitly states, um, I don't remember the language for it, but it explicitly states that you cannot use the software to do harm. Um, some of this is in reaction to recent events. Again, like I said, th these are long-running discussions and conversations in open source. So this is not a new concept, but a lot of, a lot of um, I think, attention on that recently has been around specific events, right? So who is using open source? Who is using open source technologies? to further negative causes, right? The imprisonment of people or the suppression of people um, in particular. Uh, and then also, when I said interesting people, <laughs> that's me using family-friendly language in my word camp talk. Um, but some of the heads, um, the figureheads of open source in history, you know, like 30, 40 years ago, um, are people who have always been known to not be, you know, good or kind to other people around them, especially in, uh, in certain intersections of power um, and gender. Um, so a lot of it is also thinking about like, how do we protect ourselves from people like that collecting power, right? In the name of re restoring the power to users. Um, I am not a lawyer, right? That's what we're supposed to say before we launch into discussions about these topics. Um, it is really hard for me to reconcile the idea of restricting your license with the true nature of free software, right? When we talk about WordPress specifically as free software and not just open source software um, because of the GPL, um, you can look up who whose project the FSF and the GPL was in the first place if you want to know uh, what kind of people I'm talking about. But um, it, it is really hard to reconcile those two concepts. And, I, and I, I don't know about from a legal standpoint, but certainly from um, a person working in free software, it is really hard to reconcile the idea of preventing people from using software. Um, even though I personally would love to, right? Um, but it is really hard to reconcile those ideas of licensing your software. Um, now, it would be great if our processes kept those people out, right, and prevented them from collecting power, but I don't know about the license. Um, and the other, the other thing there, I'm gonna lose this, lose this thought um, about, about those licenses um, is that, at least in, in the GPL, in the, the four freedom sense, that second freedom, that freedom to, uh, to I don't want to like misquote it, so let's just go back, um, to study how the program works and to change it, 
right? That freedom to fork a piece of software um, is also really central to, to, uh, to this, right? So can we cite that freedom as, you know, what, is that gonna make it impossible to enforce nobody being able to, to use anything derived from my software because they can always take it and change it, right? Um, but that also is important for us because we can make at least more ethical decisions in our own software as much as we can. And then if a bad actor wants to use it, then they have to go change it, right? Um, and so, you know, the power does lie with us to at least make ethical choices as much as we can. Um, but in terms of like licensing, preventing things, I don't know. First, here we go. I have a question from online. Um, how do you think the open source community, uh, the future will be influenced by um, voice technology that's being developed? Wow, I don't know if I've ever thought about those two things um, together before. Um, for me, I think anything that allows more people to participate in ways that are more accessible to them is, is a great thing, right? Um, again, you have, to, you have to have things like a code of conduct in place so that you define, you know, the behaviors that you wanna see, right? But the, the methods of accessing um, your process, your software, your communities um, do not define the behaviors themselves, right? So anything that opens up participation, um, in my opinion, is a good thing. Is there anything that you can think of or that you have in mind that we, as the WordPress community, should be thinking about and focusing on to do better? Anything specific? Yeah. Um, I'm not lecturing the community. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think that there, there are a lot of topics where we kind of paint them as being black and white, right? And, and even in the course of my talk, you know, I'm, I'm talking about things as like, this is what freedom means, and you know, all of that. Um, but it's really important to continue to remember, um, especially in the process aspect of things, right? When you have an open process for a project, it is really easy for people observing that open process to feel like they are watching decisions being made as opposed to being able to participate in that decision-making process. And I think that that's something that, especially at the scale that WordPress has reached, right? There's a lot that's different between when I first started contributing to WordPress um, and today, and I think at the scale where we are now, it is really easy to feel like you're just watching it go by, right? And that the openness of the process is actually meaningless because all it means is that you can look at it, uh, but it doesn't actually mean that you can participate in it. I think that's a very understandable feeling, um, but at the same time, I would implore the community to really think about how they're phrasing these things um, in, in the dialogues that we have with each other, right? And to remind each other that it may not feel good right now. We may disagree with things, right? We may not feel like we're being listened to. We may not feel like, you know, something is gonna go well or I think doom is coming, you know, because of X change. Um, but it is really important to remember that we can continue to talk about it, right? That we have events like this where we can come together and discuss something like auto updates with hopefully no uh, produce being thrown at anybody on stage, right? Um, so that's something that I would really like to see more of, right, is more, more acceptance that not all conversations are going to be nuanced, but that we should be able to aim for more nuance in our discussions about things, um, and to be able to remember that, you know, the process is only as open as we are making it as a community at large, right? The open process has to be a product of everybody participating in it and everybody understanding that it is an open process. Um, otherwise, it will you know, by itself become closed if people don't continue to push to participate. Helen, oh, there I am. Um, thanks for being here and thanks for giving this talk. Um, you referenced the departure of a number of people from the open source, um, I don't know, let's say, um, community, loose community. Um, <laughs> and some people who were very powerful but also very abusive. And I think uh, a lot of us see open source technologists kind of examining what that means about the values that we have kind of passively held for a long time and maybe engaging in a process of redefining 
what those collective values are. And so I'm real curious, in as you participate in that process, kind of with other people, but also um, internally, what do you hope we hold on to? And what would you like to see us let go of? Yeah. Um, that's honestly like a lot of why I changed a lot of what this talk was about in the last six to eight weeks because of current events, um, because it really made me think about like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing open source at all? Right, if we have these horrible abusive people um, and also for background, I come from classical music. Um, I have my degrees in classical music um, and classical music is very much the same as this for a lot of reasons, and, and, and more, most recently that example is the collection of power with a few very abusive, mostly men, um, in these communities who are well known, who are protected by their power, um, and should not have been, right? But everybody was complicit in it for decades. Um, if, you, if you like Google classical music scandals, that's what you're gonna get, you know, from like the last several years. Um, so I, I think about that a lot, right? Like, why am I an open source? I love classical music. I don't want to deal with this this kind of thing anymore, right? But it was known, right? This is, this is what we call like an open secret, right? Where uh, these people were this way. Um, and so when I think about, you know, what's going to happen? Is there really a vacuum of power? Um, what's going to happen as we really, really challenge what our values have been, whether passively or actively? Um, and to me, that comes down to remembering who we're making that software for. Right, and not just who we're making it for, but what they are going to do with that software. Um, and that should be for the betterment of other people, right? Not to oppress other people, not to abuse other people, but for the betterment of each other. Hi, thank you for everything you shared. And you mentioned the document from 10UP, um, the best practices. I'm assuming that that's open for us just to find on the web. Yeah, um, I really should have put a URL on this okay. slide. <laughs> um, um, it's like tenup.github.io. I'm sure we can Google um, but yeah, it. Yeah, it's on the um, The question that I have about that is, um, as a plugin developer, do you have any information about how uh, everything should be priced? Because when you look at the four freedoms, I kind of have a hard time understanding, you know, I'll just, you know, all the, all the booths that are out there, um, if they're a plug-in developer, they're having to sell something, and then when you stop paying, then you don't necessarily get it updated. So do you have any information on how to structure that in a way that really makes sense to the whole community? It just doesn't seem to be clear to me. Yeah. Um, some of that is because it's not, it is not clear to anybody, I think, generally, um, but also that it is always changing, right? The, the landscape of what we're looking at is always changing. Um, so historically, we've seen a lot of pricing models around support and being able to continue to update the plugins, right, to get the latest and greatest, um, whether that means they do like WordPress core does and split a path between security updates and, you know, continuing feature development. And it's really up to that company. Um, and then something that we've seen really rise in the last several years is um, you, you pay to access a service that is behind uh, the thing that you're on. Um, one thing that we work on at TenUp that is a free plugin itself, but the usage of it is not actually f like free as in cost, um, is a plugin called Classify, um, which ties into various cloud services in order to do um, like AI, machine learning analysis of your content, right? So it has some really cool things that I think support the open web, right? Like automatically um, creating alt text for your images, right? So that they're more accessible for everybody, um, both to people who are looking at your website and also to you, so you can search for those things later, right? So you're, you don't just have everything with like image 2048 um, as the file names for you to search for later. Um, but at the same time, like those, those services, like the machine learning itself and the ability to upload it and process it, the power behind that, those are all things that cost money, right? And so we're providing a gateway for it that itself is free, um, but it does, in the end, right, cost the user money. Um, and then, you know, the I mean, this entire ecosystem, right, a lot of it is built around services, right? That's what TenUp is, we're a service company, right? Um, there, there's so much that you can do without having to close the software. And I think that that's 
um, it's, it's tricky, right? It's not easy, right? And I think the easiest thing to think of is to close down the source of your software and sell access to the source of your software, right? So that, that tends to be like the easiest way to think about it, um, especially in the way that, you know, businesses operate and the way we think about like, how do you report profits and how do you report, you know, cost acquisition and you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, that tends to be the route a lot of people take to close down that source. Um, so it does take more creativity to think about what is a pricing model that works for you, what you're selling specifically, your product, what you're tied to, and all of that. Um, I am not a business person for a reason, so I don't really have specific pricing advice, but I think that's why it can be you know, kind of a convoluted topic. All right, this is the final question. Hi, Helen, thanks for this. Uh, this is actually not a question from me. It's from Rachel Cherry, I'm, so I'm, on the live stream. I'm legitimately shocked by this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Rachel. Um, I'm going to have to paraphrase this because it's kind of in the middle of a chat. So you mentioned this. Um, the history of open source came from trying to break power away from corporations and give it to the people. And you also kind of side mentioned that there's some power consolidation happening around corporations. So the question is, how do you reconcile the spirit of open source and the open web in projects when the projects are led by or influenced by people who ha whose main priorities have to align with profit margins for corporations? So I think that there, um, I think that I actually surprised, disagree with part of that premise, which is that the motivation behind the changes is that profit, right? So I think that in order to sponsor software development, and this is something that the open source community broadly is struggling with, um, there's there have been some really interesting things recently. Um, you can see about like a funding experiment for like NPM packages, which went over really poorly. Um, but uh, these are things that are fascinating um, and are very much the current, uh, the current hot topic, which is, you know, how do we fund open source software development, right? And and we even several years back, um, that curl vulnerability, right? Is curl? No, SSL, um, Heartbleed, where it was like discovered that it is like the part-time semi-sponsored work of one person, right? This like fundamental thing uh, to security on the internet. Um, and so that's something that's really, I think, become a current topic is that in the way that we live, because we live in a society, um, how do we fund this, this work, right? And what are those mechanisms of funding and how is that funding motivated, right? So I think that it is very easy to see a company seeking to make a profit, right? But if it's not clear to people, you know, how it's making those decisions, and it probably isn't externally, right? Because these are private companies and they do private things. Um, it is really easy when, once you add open source software to it to assume that the part that you can see is the motivation for the parts that you can't see. Um, and so I think that I, I disagree with that, right? So like, if we think about in the WordPress space, who are large companies that are supporting the development of WordPress, right? How do they derive their profit and are they making changes specifically to maximize that profit? I don't think so, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a part of a not huge company, but I mean, Tenup is about 180. Um, it's a fairly large company at this point. Um, and so what are our motivations for working on WordPress, right? Like we could be asked the same question. If I make a change in WordPress, am I gonna be questioned about, am I maximizing profit from one customer of Tenet, right? And the honest answer for me is going to be no. Um, and I think that we should assume good faith from other people, right? And, and I don't, to me, it's that I don't see that happening in the WordPress space, which continues to be shocking. Right? I, I wait for it to happen. I wait for somebody to come in and say, I want this change because it's going to make me more money. Right? Somebody just come out and baldly say it, which I would probably have to respect because you're just coming out and say it um, and then tell them no. But you know, I, I do think that this community, one of the things that's, that's been so amazing about it and what's kept me in it for as long as I've been in it is that genuinely we don't see that happening. Right? And so if I think about something like automatic, which I assume is, you know, um, something that's being pointed at here, uh, but also something like TenUp, you know, yes, we are maximizing our profits, right? We're businesses in, a, in an American society. We're American companies, right? Um, with remote employees, but we're American companies, maximizing profits, but we're not doing it at the expense of open source software, 
right? We're doing it so that we can continue to support open source software. Um, and that does mean that we're bringing our learnings into it, but I don't think that it means that we're doing it for, for the sake of our businesses in that way. All right, I'll be around. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. If you'd like to continue your conversation with Helen, she'll be around here for at least a few moments, right? Yes. I'll be All right. Our next.
Hey, everybody. Whoa. <laughs> That's right. I talk loud. I don't even need this microphone if they didn't make me have it. All right. So uh, welcome to the 11 a.m. session, and welcome to WordCamp US 2019. Yeah. Uh, make sure you silence all your devices. Those of you who have never had it happen to you, this will be the time. Um, if you're in that back corner by the door, please scoot in so there's some extra chairs so anybody who comes in late doesn't have to fight for a spot. Uh, if you have any accessibility needs or any additional questions, find a volunteer wearing a red shirt like mine or anybody wearing a black lanyard as an organizer, and they will be able to help you with any questions that you have about WordCamp. Uh, we're going to hold all questions until the end. We have microphones set up on the front corners of your, the seating areas. So anytime that you have a question, feel free to walk over in that to that area to uh, get ready for the queue. But that will be after the session when we do questions and answers. Um, and if you would like to speak with the percent presenters in length, uh, most of them will be hanging out a few minutes at least after their session. So um, we're not going to have conversations in the Q&A part. Uh, uh, everyone is encouraged to come to Contributor Day on Sunday. If you've never been to a Contributor Day, uh, stop down at the, 
the sponsor hall at the Get Involved table to learn more about Contributor Day and how you can give back to the WordPress open source project and the communities where you live. Uh, also, don't forget, WordPress party is tonight at City Museum. Uh, you need your badge to get in. If you're a kid, you also have to bring an adult, so keep that in mind. Um, now, thanks. I'm here to introduce you to our speaker. My name is Travis Flans, by the way. I'm the host just for this last session here before lunch. Uh, so we have Carrie Fisher with User Personas as an inclusive design and development tool. Carrie is an author, public speaker, and developer who is passionate about digital accessibility and promoting diversity in tech. When not with her family, traveling, gardening, or making a mess of her latest DIY project, Hmm, maybe we can figure out what that is during this session. Uh, she volunteers her time to the accessibility and dev communities. Everybody welcome Carrie Fisher. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm not that Carrie Fisher, in case you were trying to find that one. But um, I am here to give you a presentation on user personas as an inclusive design and development tool. Um, I'm doing this without notes, so uh, I might have some more details later uh, that you can get from uh, the links that I have. Uh, if I forget something today. Um, before we get going, uh, show of hands, how many people are designers in the group? All right, lots of designers. How about developers? All right, that's about 50-50. Anyone else like marketing, con like content maybe? Okay, editors, there's a few of you. There's Kevin. Uh, so this will kind of talk about all of these kind of groups. Um, again, my name is Carrie Fisher. Right now I'm a senior accessibility instructor and consultant. I work at a place called DQ. Um, we're a company that works primarily with uh, Fortune 500 companies, and we help make their websites accessible. So we touch on every kind of CMS, every kind of framework, um, either proprietary or you know out in the wild like WordPress and and Drupal and all those. Um, so yeah, so that's who I am. But before I did that, I worked as a front end developer for about 15 years. So I've got kind of that backhand knowledge and I'm kind of bringing it into the accessibility world a little bit. Anyway, that's where you can find me. So today we're just gonna talk a little bit about, um, so how many people here are familiar with like uh, accessibility best practices like WCAG and, and that sort of thing? Okay, so I won't speak too deeply on this so we can get time for some of the demos and examples. Um, but we do, you know, this might be the first time that you've talked about accessibility or digital inclusion, so I wanted to like kind of give a little bit of background for those people um, that may not have heard about it before. And then we'll jump into personas, and then I'll give you some takeaways, because I'm very practical, and I like like uh, thinking about accessibility on a kind of esoteric kind of way, but I also like to do things for on the ground, like what can you take away and actually bring to your organization and implement in the future. All right, so some background. Um, again, we're going to talk about the, the web accessibility uh, guidelines, or WCAG. Um, when we talk about people that are disabled, we're talking about people with mobility impairments, um, cognitive impairments, hearing, vision, um, et cetera. There's, this is the one from the CDC talking about the different percentages of people. We also talk about um, you know, the whole 56.7 million people or 1 billion people in the world that are self-identifying as having a disability. But of course, that doesn't include all the other people in the world that could benefit from accessible websites and apps. Uh, the guidelines, especially for people who aren't necessarily accessibility specialists or have to really like kind of get into the nitty gritty, um, we kind of talk about the VOCAG guidelines um, more holistically, more kind of like on the top level. Uh, as you get to know uh, website accessibility, you can get into like super fine, detailed, granular things, just like you could with any sort of um, tech out there. So we like to kind of take it back a little bit sometimes for like newer people to think about it more conceptually. So again, robust, uh, sorry, perceivable, operable, uh, understandable, and robust, it's the poor acronym. So we broke that down into kind of these groups. Uh, perceivable would basically be asking yourself, is there anything on our website or app that a person with a disability would not be able to perceive? So that's kind of the understanding, like the hearing, the sight. Um, this little icon is a braille device. So. Uh, next is operable. So you're asking yourself questions like, can users control interactive elements on our website or app? 
or does our website have any traps? Uh, I see that a lot with keyboard traps, for instance. Um, an easy one for testing uh, keyboard traps is just using your keyboard, right? Throw away your mouse and just pressing tab uh, and trying to interact with everything on a website. Next is the understandable, where you're asking yourself, is all the content clearly written? Are all the interactions easy to understand? And does the order of the page make sense? Uh, this is one with especially like the WCAG 2.1, there was a refresh just recently last year, um, addressed more of these cognitive needs because again, cognitive, going back to that, that graph, that is one of the number one disabilities after mobility issues, is cognitive. And if you think about people on the web, a lot of the people who have, you know, if you think of someone in a wheelchair, right, uh, they're disabled, mo they have some mobility impairments, but they might be able to interact just fine on a website or app. They might have full use of their arms and their fingers. Um, but this other group here, this understandable, this is a huge group. We're talking about people with like ADHD, people with Down syndrome, people with dyslexia, right? And how can we make websites and apps more, um, more robust for them. So this one's a very difficult one to like totally get right, but it's very important and one that we're starting to highlight more in the field of accessibility. And this last one is robust here. So we ask ourselves, does our website only support the newest browsers or operating systems? Is our website developed with best practices? And does it work both in landscape and portrait orientation? So this one, <laughs> this one's hard because if you think about all the devices that are out there, you think about all the, the, the fluidity that we have now on the web and on apps and how you can't really predict the device anymore. Um, if there's anyone out there who's been developing for a while, we remember the advent of like the mobile, the mobile first, right, 2005 or something, it came. And as a front end developer, I remember like my mind being blown by the concept of how do I make this website work not only on desktop, but on this like laptop and on this phone. And that was, you know, we had three breakpoints to uh, design and develop to, and now we have infinite numbers. Um, so we're robust in some ways is really easy nowadays because we have that kind of fluidity that we have now in, in the web device. But then we have the new things, like we have games, um, we have uh, watches, wearables, right? So it's voice activated controls, that sort of thing. So we're kind of coming into that new advent of of explosion of technology and how that fits in with the accessibility sphere. So this one's kind of an interesting one. Uh, in case you weren't aware, the accessibility is a numeronym. Uh, it's short for accessibility, A, 11 letters, and Y. So if you ever see that out there in the wild. So today we're gonna talk more uh, about inclusive design and development too and in relation to the personas, but what I think about with, in this whole inclusive design and development, what we're doing is we're targeting this 25% of the severe disabilities in this uh, pyramid that you see over here. So we have a pyramid for those may, uh, who have, may have low vision. We have a pyramid, we have 25% severe diffi difficulties, 37% mild difficulties, 16% minimal, and 21% no difficulties. And then at the very top, we have a target for specialized prod products. So the, the goal here for all of you, and when you're thinking about inclusive design and development, is to be targeting that 25%. And what you do is by targeting that 25%, everybody underneath that can also use that whatever design or that code or whatever you, in that particular thing that you're targeting. I'm gonna show example next. But the extension is something where specialized tools like assistive technology devices, like a screen reader, for instance, or a braille device, that's where those things would come in. So again, as our job as designers and developers, are kind of to target that 25%. Not that you're forgetting the top, top, but you want to make sure that you target that and go down. So an example of this is like choosing an inclusive font. So right here we have uh, Gilsons versus PT Mono. And so you can see in this example, we have the word India, lettuce, and the number one for cat. And this is in Gilson's, my, my I, capital I, my lowercase l, and my number one all look the same. They all look like a line. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten like passwords with like numbers and lines in it, and sometimes you're like, is that an L? Is that an I? Is that a one? What is going on? Um, and in Gilson's, we also have that thing where we have uh, the chirality of the B and the D and the P and the Q. 
So if you can flip something in a mirror and it looks exactly the same, essentially, um, that's not a necessarily an inclusive font. Whereas in PT Mono, you can see clearly like the I in India, the L in lettuce, and the one are very distinct. I'm not gonna confuse the capital I from the number one, for instance. And you can see my Bs and my Ds have little mini sans serifs uh, identifying that they're slightly different. And we'll see that in a, a little demo later. But does that make sense? The, so what we're doing, going back to that, we've chosen a font. In this case, we're choosing the font PT Mono. We know that people with dyslexia, for instance, or ADHD, or some kind of cognitive issues might be able to understand it. And so by targeting that 25%, everyone under, underneath that can also understand it. So, yeah. Uh, also, we talked about thinking about color and contrast. Um, I'm gonna show a couple uh, demos on that one too, so I won't go too far into that. But just knowing that uh, that might be something that a lot of designers already are aware of, but if you're not, uh, WCAG has regulations for uh, small font and large font and the color ratio. And you don't have to memorize it or you don't have to guess. There's tons of tools that are out there and so they're really great. One of the tools I'm gonna show you is like, goes beyond even what uh, the, some of the automated tools do. I'll show that right now. So this first one here is called Ally Rocks. It's an Ally Color Palette. And I call it Ally, some people call it, say A11Y. Um, but Ali, so does anyone have like a fun font or a fun uh, hex, like a favorite hex color? Just yell it out. <laughs> two, five, two, four, D-A? D-four-A, okay, I'm dyslexic this morning. D-four-A. I think I got that. Anyone else? Oh, we got it. F-F. 388, I think. All right, any other ones? I know. Not a big deal. We'll do that. All right, we got some great uh, hexes. I use some of the, the basic ones as well. And the reason why I like this Ally color palette is because what it does is it tells me, I put in all my colors, right? It could be brand colors. It could be the ones that I'm thinking about doing for my next design. And I'm gonna see the kind of combinations of what works and what's most accessible, the color combinations. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna show you the first combination that's the most robust, most accessible first. And of course, that's black and white. Um, but as I go down here, I can see like, you know, this peachy, orangey color with uh, black, a little Halloween-y. Um, but it kinda of goes down here and you can see down here where it fails. It'll tell you if it fails, the ratio. And then you get down here and you get like, this pink and this orange on top of the orange, and you can see that that definitely isn't very accessible because if I wrote text on this um, background with that color, that combination would fail. So I kind of like this. This is also good for if you've got um, like clients that you're trying to show like, hey, these are the combinations that are gonna work best on your site. Uh, so we have that one. This other one that I really like is called the Color Contrast Analyzer because I think a lot of people especially in design, um, you know, maybe your, your design's not in code yet, maybe you're still kind of figuring out, you're in your wireframe or mock-up stage and you're just trying to figure it out, the palettes like we just showed. Um, so the color contrast analyzer is really great because, and this is also good for people who are doing assessments or checking dev, because automatic color tester tools are only gonna pick up hex versus hex. They can't pick up like color, uh, like a text on top of a gradient or text on top of an image, right? And so these are the places where you can spot check because this one does not require code. Like you can see in my cute little background here, my little fire and the dogs. So if I wanted to, as a designer, I'm like, oh, I really love that green. I mean, I don't, but I might. So I picked that one, right? And I can see right away that if I wanted to have, here I'll swap swap the size. So if I was gonna have white text that maybe wasn't the best choice um, for my background, so I can see right here I have the contrast ratio 1.5 to 1. If I wanna kinda get in here a little bit deeper, it'll tell me. Same with icons, this is really great for icons. Um, so then I could just you know play around, maybe I want that darker color, oh, I still am failing. So maybe I go for the black, obviously that will pass. Um, but I really like this tool, again, because I can pick up on anything. It doesn't have to be code. It can just be random. Um, so I don't know that a lot of people are aware of that tool yet, so I'd like to point that one out. 
All right. So I'll move on to personas. So personas, they answer that question of who we're designing and developing for um, to help align strategies and goals for user groups and, and things like that. So here we go. Uh, but personas aren't, uh, personas are kind of one of those things that are, it's kind of a gray area, right, where you, you want to use them, but you don't want to only use them. Um, personas, in a way, are, are a way to help guide the design and development process before you get to your user testing. So this is just sort of a, a guide. So we definitely want to make sure your personas are based on real user data, hopefully your own, but it could be somebody else's. Um, it's also supported by all teams. It's not just coming from design and that's it, and developers never see it. Um, and you want to make sure it's communicated early and often. And I think of it typically as a tool set to uh, create empathy. So again, it's, it's thinking about people in a different way. Uh, personas are not stereotypes. Uh, we don't want to just do this and then like never use them. They're not colorful artwork. Um, also not a substitute, like I said, to user testing. So you definitely want to use your, do your user testing later, later. And they are useful, but they're not useful if you don't use them. So I'm going to have to, sorry, unfortunately, I got to read the notes here on him. So all my personas have kind of like a lot of information, so I just wanted to read this. So we have Isaiah Smith, his occupation, he's an eighth grader. Um, his culture is deaf, and what he wants to do is he wants to, to watch an online video. So the first persona is Isaiah. Uh, he is deaf, but he doesn't actually seen, uh, be seen deaf as a disability. He considers it a culture, like I mentioned, as many deaf people do. He attends a deaf high school, uh, and his primary language is ASL, so American Sign Language. And that's true of a lot of deaf people. They don't necessarily learn English first, they learn uh, sign language first. Uh, but being deaf hasn't slowed him down much in his 13 years. He may be young, but he's already a whiz on the computer. He builds websites in his spare time and is part of his school robotics club. He's hoping for his team to win nationals this year, but a lot of the tutorials he's found online have been hard for him to use since the instructions aren't subtitled. So here's an example, kind of like the reverse of what uh, Isaiah would, would experience. So watch this video. This man is using American Sign Language, and he's telling us a story. So does anyone here know ASL? A little bit, maybe? Maybe not? I don't know it either. I know a few things. I can sign my name and say, like, thank you and things like that. But um, he's telling us a joke. And what do you think that he's telling us, anyone? You saw the title before I played it. You might have a better clue there. So he's a lumberjack. He's cutting down a tree, right? He's telling us a joke. There's a tree. It's falling. He's saying timber. He's spelling out timber, right? And so this is the reality for people um, who, you know, are deaf, right? They, if you don't have captioning, if you don't have transcripts, if you don't have... Uh, supplemental information, it's essentially the same thing as us watching him tell a story in ASL. Because we don't know that language and there's no captioning, we don't really know what's going on in the story. So we get to, we miss out on the joke, right? He, and he's very expression, like I feel like if you can watch it, you can kind of get an idea that's probably similar to what someone might feel like if they're watching a video that wasn't captioned. Um, I'll tell you, if anyone wants a transcript later of what it is, but it's pretty funny. Yeah, he's eating the sandwich. So it's, again, it's just important to kind of think about that. Uh, has anyone watched the caption fail videos? All right, this one's really funny too. Um, so I won't, I won't set it up, let's see if he can just talk. It's a few minutes long, so bear with me. Why settle for a one note grab and go breakfast? That's an ad. <laughs> the McDonald's kitchen is a sizzling, toasty parts. symphony. It's time to wake up breakfast. I don't pay for my YouTube, McDonald's. so unfortunately. You might have seen that a lot of YouTube videos have this closed caption option now, where you can click the little CC button and it'll Sound display specific. text on the screen for what's being said in the video. The whole process is automated. A computer listens to the video and displays what it thinks it hears. So the results are always off and usually pretty hilarious. So we had this idea to play telephone with YouTube transcriptions. We wrote a script, filmed it, and uploaded the video to YouTube. Then we downloaded the computer's transcript and used that as our script for round two. Then we uploaded that to YouTube to get another script, which became round three. 
We've included the text on the screen to make it easier to understand what we're saying. Enjoy. It's a fun take on uh, captioning. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, I've been trying to read you for the past hour. What have you been doing? Oh, nothing. I was just polishing my Little League MVP trophy. Is that a euphemism for something? Uh, no. What are you eating? A 100% organic, free-range black bean vegan burrito. How can a black bean be free-range? I don't know. Google it. You'll never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Uh, an iPhone? I got tickets to the Lady Gaga Putt Putt Tournament of Monster Truck Rally. With the opening act, Little People with Piercings? Yes! I can't believe it. You're my best friend, man. When do we go? Actually, I'm not taking you. I'm taking Elise, my eight-year-old niece. You mean the niece has been trapped in that goat cheese making cult in southern Venezuela? Well, it's a llama butter making cult in South Carolina, but yeah. Well, next time you want to call me and not invite me to something, they just don't call me at all. Well, next time you don't want to be happy for me when my niece is released from a cult and gets to go with me to an amazing concert, don't answer your phone. Fine. Fine. Hey, man. Anytime we put that style, what you been doing? Well, nothing, which is polishing my Little League MVP traffic. Resenting you for missing into something? No. What are you eating? Or 100% organic, free-range, but the Indian retail. Part of my baby free-range. Parallel to collect. Never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Marathon. Advantages to the Lady Gaga puppet to name us a drug right. Would the opening at Little People would be a sense then? U.S. But do you believe it? Your best friend. Move again. Actually, I'm not taking it to get at least nine-year-old niece. You mean he's been trapped in a goat cheese making calls and network? Was a lot about meeting. Construct a line of the year. Without anyone calm united by minister to the so-called me at all. Well, next time you don't want to be happy for me, woman eases release from a cotton disability to an amazing concert donating your poem. Five. Five. Hey, man. Any time, but that's how we've handled one. I think what you're talking about, the legality traffic. Resenting your permissiveness something? No. What are you reading? Oracle organic free range, but being in retail. Part of a difference free range? Parallel to collect. Never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Marathon. Advantages of the Lady Gaga puppets and a lot of Iraq. With the other email, it would be a sense that? You pets! But it was a bit. Your best friend. When we get. Action not taking a dig, at least nine-year-old niece. You mean he's been trapped in a goat cheese making calls a network. Was a lot about meeting, construct a line in the year. Without anyone called, united by minister to the so-called me at all. Well, next time you know one of the happy for me at a news release from a cotton, this ability to an amazing concert, donating your poll. Fact. Facts. You still there? So there's a bunch of these, and so it, it's illustrating, it's really funny, and I think that accessibility is one of those things that kind of is, it's heavy, right? There's a lot going on, a lot to think about. Um, but this is a kind of a lighthearted take on this. So basically what they're doing is they're kind of making fun of the craptions. That's what we call captions that aren't like the live ones that are going on right now. I'm not sure, it may be over there. Um, but so when you don't have, uh, when you rely on machines to do the captioning for you, this is the kind of result that you would get. Um, I work on an organization called Accessibility Talks, and um, so I'm just showing you this real quick. We have uh, access to, it's really easy to, uh, to change your, your, um, your videos, uh, trying to say what I'm trying to say, captions on your videos. Uh, what I do is basically I upload a video to YouTube, right? And I just uploaded this one, I think, yesterday. And what I do is I let um, YouTube do its thing, right? Do its initial captioning because that's a lot of work and they can do it. Um, and then I go in and I actually edit the captionings. Uh, so I go, this is English by YouTube automatic and then English by you. And so in this particular case, I look at what they do and then I update the things. Uh, one thing to think about also with captioning is that punctuation, capitalization, who's speaking, that sort of thing, these things are all important. So it's really easy to do. You can kind of do a combination of the both. Uh, so getting back to this like Isaiah here and our persona, uh, we just want to make sure that our videos have captions and or transcripts. Again, depending on what kind of level of uh, compliance that you need to have for accessibility makes you have to do certain things. Hand captioning is best, like we mentioned, uh, but the automatic captioning is better than nothing at all. 
but just go back in and edit it. It's really, it doesn't take very long. It takes me about an hour to edit a video after that. Um, and transcripts and captions are different, uh, and they're both important. So it's important to know, we also have this thing called audio description. So audio description would be something like um, scary music in the background or somebody whispers off screen, right? It's kind of setting that mood and kind of, you wouldn't know that it was eerie without that eerie music, right? So you're giving context to the content. All right, and then now we have Farah. Farah is a sysadmin for a well-known company. The systems she maintains are crucial to keeping her company service running. And she has a lot of team members who needs uh, end up supporting throughout the day. She's the queen of putting out technical fires and she's everyone's go-to in the department when anything goes down unexpectedly. Farah has always been dedicated to physical fitness and she played left forward on her college soccer team and loves running marathons. Uh, this made it all more of a blow when she was diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's last year. Losing her fine motor skills to tremors is making it increasingly more difficult to use a mouse. And she's already been steadily relying on the keyboard more and more to navigate the web. So we're going to talk about mobilities. Uh, more people in the United States have a mobility disability than live in the state of California, and they outnumber California residents by nearly three in million. All right, this one. So <laughs> ironically, so anyone who knows about accessibility knows that recently that there was a lawsuit with uh, Domino's, and this was ironically my uh, example like several months ago before the thing happened, and that's just kind of funny to me now that, um, yeah, this was my example. So what I'm doing is I'm showing you an emulator called uh, Funkify. It has a lot of different emulators and simulators. And just like in web development, right, there's only so much you can trust emulators and simulators. It's not going to give you the full picture, right? It's giving you a simulated experience. Um, mileage may vary. Uh, but in this particular case, we're being uh, Farah, and we have a trimmer. So I've turned on Funkify. It's just an extension. Uh, there's a free version and a premium. And I press Start. And you can see my mouse, if it's here, it's kind of moving around, and it's simulating what it might be to have like a hand trimmer. And so I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to, to do this, right? This is without keyboard, right? Let's say I don't have access to a keyboard, now I'm trying to select a state. I'm really trying. Normally I have someone come up here and do it, but this is too big of a comp uh, room, I think. Um, but you can see kind of the, the effect of this person with a hand trimmer trying to order a pizza. Um, and it's just pretty much impossible. Um, it's gonna take me you know, a little bit longer than the average person to do it. So you can see how that could be a little bit frustrating after a time. So at some point, she probably would just call in and just kind of give up. Um, navigating by keyboard alone is really awesome. Uh, I think it was Marcy Sutton, she just came out with a, uh, an NPM package where you can install like to disable your mouse. And it'd be kind of fun to do to a coworker. Uh, you just go in, disable their mouse, and then see how they interact with the day. Um, because what you find is sites like Skittles, um, I think this is actually their Tumblr, but it's skittles.com, right? That's my view where I go first to, to talk about, like, maybe my package of Skittles. Did anyone hear about those zombie Skittles? Okay, they, they, they just look like normal Skittles, but every once in a while you get a really weird tasting one. like. I don't know if I like that idea, but let's say you get a, a package of zombie Skittles, but you think that they're normal Skittles, so you want to come in here and complain. Uh, you can see my hover for legal includes accessibility and other ways to contact them. But if I was a keyboard-only navigator like Farah, I could never get to that because that's a hover effect only. Like, I can't even see my, I can't, I don't even know where I am on the page because my focus indicator is missing, but I am tabbing here. Let's see, I don't want to go into that. All right. Yeah, so I can just tab throughout. Oh, there I am going further down. So I'm actually moving on the page now. But no matter how long I try, this infinite scroll doesn't allow me to jump into that, the bottom part, the legal part, the accessibility part. So again, this is an easy test for, for a lot of people. Uh, you can do a simulator like the one that we saw for Funkify, or just use your keyboard, press tab, and see what happens. Let's go back to that. Go a little bit faster here. So again, for people like Fair with uh, cognitive, or not cognitive, but physical disabilities, like hands, they want to make sure you plan out heading pages structure, make sure it makes sense to all users on all devices. 
Um, and if you place important actions at the top of the bottom of the page, make sure that people can actually get to them. Um, using and adding skip links to content. So like maybe your menu has 50 items and you don't want someone to have to tab through all 50 items. Give them an option to like skip over it. It's just a simple anchor tag. Like it's not very complex at all. All right, so now we have Owen. Owen O'Connor is a student at a local university who is studying botany. He really loves learning about the latest discoveries in the plant world and regularly visits online plant journals to read their articles. His favorite website has just released an interesting new study, but he can't interpret the findings because the charts are all color-coded and poorly labeled. A fun fact, uh, one in 12 men have some sort of color blindness. So looking in the room, there's a lot, a lot of men here. Uh, probably a few of you have color blindness, right? And you probably wouldn't think, hey, that's a disability. No one would check the, mar the box like, oh, I'm disabled. I'm just colorblind. I just happen to perceive colors a different way. Um, so this is one of those kind of hidden disabilities where it's not that you can't get by on your day, but if you had a chart in Owen's case, he's got this chart and he's talking about uh, three different plants, but the colors to him look like this. And for him, without proper labels, he doesn't really understand the content, right? So in a way, he is uh, not disabled, but he is, could uh, be benefited from accessible websites. So here's an example, here's the two. So we have clementine, tangerine, and kumquat. So on the left, if you don't have color blindness, we have like a green, like a tan, and like an orange, kind of an ugly design color combination. But on the right, we have um, the, they're all kind of green, versions of green. So how do you think that he could maybe help this? How could, how could the developer designer help him? Any thoughts? What'd you say? Label each bar. Introduce patterns, yeah. Yeah, maybe a different kind of color contrast, a different palette. Those are all great. So again, just making sure that you don't make color the only identifier. So in that case, color was the only real identifier. Um, using tools to simulate what your site or app would look like for different uh, types of color blindness. I'll show you a simulator for that too. But again, keeping in mind that this is just a simulator. Um, you wanna test out levels of grayscale and not necessarily because so many people with color blindness see gray, because that's kind of a misnomer. Um, that's very, very rare just to see gray. Um, but that helps you a lot, really identify color contrast issues for people with like low vision. So it'll pop out some different things for you. So like you guys suggested, we have maybe a gradient or maybe change the different colors. Maybe we actually write uh, the number on top of the, uh, the bar graph, right? There's a lot of different ways. Or in this case, we also have the example of adding a table element. So presenting the data in a different non-visual way. See you real quick. I could actually do it on, here, let's do it on wordcamp.com. <laughs> we'll, we'll pick on them. It actually looks pretty good. Uh, but let's see what it looks like. We have this other simulator I like to use called Chrome Lens. Um, I installed it as an extension, and then I'm going to just press Chrome Lens here. Can you guys see that okay? Make it a little bigger. Uh, so it's showing you how the pages look through the eyes of someone with vision issues. So if I press enable lens, the first thing I see is full blindness, which I always find is funny. This is full blindness. It's just a black screen. Uh, affects 39 million people. But in here, I can also choose some things like partial blindness or serious, you know, serious uh, to medium to mild blindness or partial blindness. Because again, you can be blind in a gradient. It's not just like you don't see everything. Like a lot of people who are blind still see shadows. They still see colors, outlines, uh, changes in um, intensity of light. So it's not just black. Um, but this is the kind of one I like to look at, are these different types of red weak, red blind, green blind. You can see how these colors are pretty close, how things are kind of green here. Blue blind. Blue blind is my favorite. <laughs> I don't know if that's a bad thing to say. Like it's a, my favorite uh, color blindness, but I like these kind of pinks and, and greens that come out. Um, but you can see, and this is the extreme one, which is the gray. And I can see already like that color contrast, just changing that to that grayscale. 
these colors to me, just like we saw with Owen, they look pretty much the same. So in this case, I don't necessarily need these colors to help me identify anything on the page or do any task here, um, but I'm kind of missing out on that as well. All right. All right. Now we have Eddie. Eddie's cool. Eddie loved to build websites since middle school. He's always had a natural talent with code, especially back in development. This was for, uh, he works primarily in Drupal, but he also likes WordPress uh, because it's convenient for him to use. Uh, he likes the CMSs. Uh, despite being great at building websites and knowing all the ins and outs of accessible tech, there's still a lot online like a pro like him can't even access. Uh, so he's always considered himself a social guy and he's got a pretty serious relationship going on with his smartphone. He loves social media and spends his idle time on Facebook and Twitter. While most of his friends are pretty good at adding alternative text on the posts for him, a lot of people and companies he follows on Twitter, Twitter tend to forget. Uh, he wants to stay up to date, um, but the popularity of posting all text memes or GIFs and other picture-related based posts blocks him from being included. All right, so Eddie might be someone who comes to a site and he gets, a, um, he gets to an image and his screen reader is gonna read this alt. In this case, it just says snail, right? And you're like, yay, I'm a developer, I'm great. I added an alt, right? But what does snail mean? Is it like a normal snail just eating lettuce? Is it like a psychedelic snail from the 70s? Maybe it's one of those snail massage face, fish things, whatever facials. Or maybe it's like SpongeBob's friend, Gary the snail, and it's a sweatshirt. So snail is a step in the right direction, but it doesn't really tell us the full story. So in case, instead maybe I said, small pink snail resting on the top of a gray cap mushroom with green moss in the background. That's probably closer to what you might have envisioned and thought about in your head. Um, we have to think about alts as, I think of them as a conversation, almost like a phone conversation. I'm gonna call up my mom and I said, hey, I'm, I'm in the park and there's two dogs. And I hang up. Okay, that's factual, but if I called her back and I said, Hey mom, I'm in the park, there's two dogs, and one is chasing me, right? That's a totally different picture than what you might have thought the first time. So again, alts aren't just about like snail, it's about what the snail's doing, the emotion, the feeling, um, the context of what the snail's doing. And I see this a lot too, like snail, the alt is save on nature tours at national parks, coupons, tours, Tours, wildlife, ecology, education, field trip vacations, cheap free parking. Um, that's ke called keyword stuffing, and that is a black hat SEO. Like, don't do this. But people do that a lot, um, and you'll get dinged for it for sure. All right, so here again, we're Eddie. Um, Abdul here has this post. It says he has my vote election day on Twitter. What do we think that, you know, it's in November of 2016, around the presidential election, the last one. Who do you think he has, he's voting for? He didn't, he didn't, add, hmm? Oh, Democrat? Um, no, he's voting for this uh, dog. Thora Michelson says no to vacuums. Um, do I realize I have five minutes left? Oh my gosh, I need to go faster. So this dog, because he uh, included alt, can kind of get Eddie and people like that in that conversation. Um, just pointing out real quick, it's really easy to go in here to your profile, you go to more, you go to settings and privacy, um, and then you go into, where is it, accessibility down here, and you can choose this compose image description. So that gives me, every time I post, uh, Instagram is also good about this, you can add captions to it. Um, in this case, we also have the option to reduce motion. But there aren't any ways to add uh, information, alt information to like GIFs or videos. So we wanna make sure that we add additional content in the actual text that we're doing. So I have less than five minutes and go past a few of them. We'll go on to, to, the, to the takeaways because I'm really, really at the end. Um, so going back to, uh, so I kind of skipped through a few of those real quick, so sorry talking too much. So I train sometimes and I go for like two days and then speak for like 16 hours. So I, this is really fast. So we'll go back to this real quick. So I'll go fast. So making sure you turn on your images. This is for Eddie, gifts and that sort of thing. Melissa has dyslexia. 
and I had a really cool demo for her, but you can see me at lunch. We can go through it if you want to see it. Um, but making sure you have inclusive fonts like we talked about at the beginning, um, adding things in M's and RIMs, making sure that you do uh, t to scale things, uh, making sure you add things like margins, padding, line spacing, and things to your text are useful for people like um, Melissa who have dyslexia. Also bringing your text into small pieces or bullet points and numbers. Um, there's a cool little demo with, um, with dyslexia, again, using Funkify. We have this Dyslexia Danny, and you know, you kind of take a look at this. This is an introductory guide to understanding cognitive disabilities. And again, this is simulating what it might look like to dyslexia, people who are dyslexic, have dyslexia. And so things are kind of changing and moving, and one letter might be, or might be moving to another section and that sort of thing. So thinking about people simulating your content, making sure that that makes sense. Um, is something to think about when you're using, when you're creating content or developing and designing. We have Camilla, she's got aphasia. Aphasia is one of those cognitive issues um, where you confuse things with other things. So I might put up a picture of a horse and she might identify that as a cat. And so in making sure that you add, a, again, additional content, if you're using icons, um, add text to it. Um, it's not too difficult to do. Uh, making sure there's enough white space so it's not like things are on top of each other to minimize with those distractions. And then also giving users enough time to complete tasks. We have this time where um, we kind of can get timed out. So we wanna make sure like if I'm doing like a bank application or something like that um, and I'm typing halfway through, it says, hey, this is your, your checkout warning. Like your session's about to do to time out due to inactivity, would you want to continue or do you want to end? So giving your users like choices to extend the time, thinking about them cognitively, like processing. Uh, this is especially true if you're doing anything with like bank information, right, taxes, anything like personal information that they're putting out there. Going faster. And the last one's Raymond, so he's got vestibular disorder. Um, what vestibular disorder is, is like going to a site like this. I'm not going to show you an extreme version. This is kind of a, a low-key version, but if you do have things with vertigo, don't watch this part. Close your eyes. But as I'm scrolling down the page, things are kind of moving around. And as designers and developers, this is kind of sites that like, we love to design and develop for because it's pretty exciting, right? There's a lot going on. I can do like cool SVGs, um, all this kind of cool movement with animations. Um, with code, and so it's, it's interesting and it's cool, but you can also do that responsibly, right? We have this really cool thing called prefers reduced motion that's out. It's supported by a lot of browsers and it's becoming more and more popular. But what I could do as a front-end developer is I could add just a, an at query. It's an at re prefers reduced motion, and then I add additional content of what I want it to do. So in the case of like my website, if I go to carriefisher.com, tapping on my time. So I've got this kind of like purpley floaty things. But if I go into my settings and I go into accessibility and I go into display, I have this one that's called reduced motion and you can see my purpley things disappeared. And that's the same thing like with my about here, it stopped. But if I go back here, and refresh it, it's actually an SVG that kind of like outlines and like builds it in. So it was very simple, I just could just stop my animation, but as a designer or developer, you could add additional kind of fun things that are maybe slower paced or, or some other options that might not uh, trigger somebody like um, Raymond. So unfortunately, I have one more minute left, but uh, so I'll finish up on Raymond, but there's some really great resources. Um, that I have linked to as well. But again, don't automate or play your media or slideshows. Make sure the user takes control of media-based features, careful of GIFs or animations and other delights. I'm not saying as a designer or developer you can't do fun things, like I want you to do fun things, but just do it in a responsible way. Give uh, alternate options for whatever delight that you wanna put out there so you don't trigger things like vertigo and seizures. I'm gonna jump to the end there. Um, but there are a lot of people that you're gonna think about at different processes, like in the content phase, um, in the design phase, in the mock-up, in the in development phase, you're thinking about different groups. 
but at the end, I just want you to be thinking about them. It doesn't matter how and when you want to do it often, but there's a lot of great resources. If you go to bit.ly slash A11YRESOURCES, Alley Resources, uh, you'll find links to things like these really cool government um, uh, personas, the UK government personas. And then the Alley Rocks Accessibility Style Guide, Chrome Lens, Color Contrast Analyzer, Funkify, some of those things that we demoed today. So the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So I hope that you think about this the next time you design and develop. So, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, Carrie will be hanging around if you want to ask any questions. Sorry, um, about, that. Sorry about the time there. No, lots, to, of, yeah. lots of great information. So it's fine if you go right up against the time. Um, so thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, lunch is served at noon. That's downstairs in Hall 2. That's next to Hall 1, which is the sponsor hall. Um, dietary needs such as gluten-free, vegetarian, et cetera, are, have signs at each of the stations. It's a buffet style. Uh, if you ha have uh, kosher or halal meals or any other sort of special dietary needs, grab a uniformed catering staff member, and they have all of that for anybody with special dietary needs. Um, and we will be back here at 1 p.m. for a tour through the WordPress database with Ju Julie Keel. Thank you.
Take that again. <laughs> All righty. Uh, welcome to WordCamp US 2019. We're excited to be here in St. Louis. My name is Tom Carney, and I will be your host uh, today until um, 5 o'clock. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to go over a couple things. Uh, if you could silence all cell phones and other electronic devices likely to make noise. Um, if you could, please move uh, closer to the center um, so uh, people can get to uh, seats uh, you know, when they come in a little bit later. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. A mic around here will be able to get you a mic uh, to uh, ask your question. Um, there will be a Q&A after the presentation uh, on this talk. Um, and then in the interest of time, just to leave all questions to the end. Um, if you want to speak with the presenter, just speak with her at the end of her, or at the end of this presentation. Um, and remember, uh, the uh, after party, you will need your uh, badges, and that will be at the museum. Um, and we want to encourage everyone to uh, come out to Contributor Day on Sunday. Um, and then uh, here is um, Julie uh, Cool. She is uh, she lives in North or Fargo, North Dakota. She currently provides uh, technical support for Co Schedule which makes a family of agile marketing products that organizes content like WordPress posts, social media, and um, marketing team workflows. But next week, she'll be at a new position uh, as a support analyst with Infinite Leap, which provides real-time technology services and healthcare solutions. Besides WordPress, Julie's other passions includes cars and, and motorcycles. Uh, dive bars, s science fiction, blacksmithing, and bagpipes. Please uh, uh, let me introduce Julie Kuhl. Well, we didn't tell you about the bright lights up here. looks a little odd and not like it looked 15 minutes ago. Is there anything we need to do there? There we go. That looks better. Okay, before we begin, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, first off, I am certainly not a database expert. Um, honestly, I really don't even work with the WordPress database. If you heard me, I do support and for marketing teams and now healthcare providers. So I don't really dig into the database on a regular basis. But a friend once told me, a friend named Drew Jaynes, um, that if you wanna learn WordPress, you should just read the code. And so um, I looked at him like he was nuts. Um, because at that time I wasn't a coder. Um, but whether or not I understood everything I was looking at or not, because I most certainly did not, um, I learned a bunch just by looking at that code. Uh, and every time I looked, I found some, I understood it a bit more. So in that, this talk is meant to be in the spirit of that advice, uh, just learning by looking. So we're going to take a tour of the WordPress database together. And when you ask questions that I can't answer, um, I will be happy to ask the crowd and find someone who can. <laughs> so with that, let's begin. WordPress is the combination of code files such as PHP, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and a database. You need both. And we actually spend a lot of time talking about the, the code files, you know, themes and plugins and what goes into those, and even WordPress code in itself. Um, but many of us don't really know much about the database. 
which is, doesn't kind of get its fair share. So if you've never actually lifted the hood to take a look at the WordPress database, here we go. First off, oh, and I should say too, if this is not what you expected, now is your chance to get up and go and go to the other wonderful talks that are going on that I kind of wish I was going to as well, but because um, they're all really good. But yeah, if this is not what you expected from that, from this talk, then feel free to uh, um, head over to one of the other options. So I'm going to start with why a database. Because you can keep information in a lot of different formats. You can keep it, um, well, you can keep it on sticky notes, and you can keep it on notepads, and you can keep it in document files, um, Word files, Google Doc files, those types of things. But, but why a database? Um, because databases, when you use a database, the files, the, the amount of space that you're taking with those files is actually smaller. Um, that makes them faster to use, faster to return to display in a, word, in a website, makes them faster to search. So if you're actually looking for something, it's faster to find what you're looking for. And one of the most important reasons is that because they're more flexible and therefore more powerful. And even WordPress in general takes advantage of some of this concepts that we're going to talk about in terms of a database because it grabs information from one file and puts it in with another file and another file to create a web page, a dynamic web page rather than a static web page. So then what is a database? Well, it's an organized set of data. It's kind of like a spreadsheet, sort of, but not really. It does have columns and rows, um, has fields or cells, I guess we'd call them. But what's different about it is that it's divided into different spreadsheets, which in a database, which are called tables, um, that are then connected to each other. So spreadsheets are usually, and I know you can have multiple spreadsheets, and even Excel will let you connect spreadsheets to one another, and that's getting kind of close to a database, um, but not really. Um, because a good database is going to be normalized. And if you do any coding, you probably have heard of the dry principle of DRY, don't repeat yourself. You want to only have information stored once in one place. It makes it easier to find, and most importantly, for me at least, is that makes it easier to update and maintain. Um, if you have a typo and that typo is only in one place, it's pretty easy to fix that typo. Or if somebody's phone number changes, or if your address changes, or your last name changes. Um, if that name or phone number or address is in one place, you update it there and use it everywhere, that's pretty easy. If that phone or name or address is stored in 312 different locations, I can guarantee you that you will miss one. So the idea uh, of a good database being normalized is to help prevent those types of problems. And they're also relational. And this is where we really depart from being a spreadsheet into being a database, um, where the data that is stored in a particular place can be related to data that is stored in a different place. And after I'd basically kind of written that slide, I did a quick um, search to make sure I really understood the definition of those uh, two and ran across this one, which basically says exactly what I was trying to say, but better. Um, it said, normalization is the process of reorganizing data in a database so that it meets two basic requirements. The first, that, that there is no redundancy of data, the dry principle. All data is stored in only one place and that data dependencies are logical, meaning that related data items are stored together. So in my example of phone numbers, all phone numbers would be stored together, all names would be stored together, all addresses would be stored together. And it's important um, for many reasons, but chiefly because it allows databases to take up as little disk space as possible, resulting in increased performance. And we get so used to offloading stuff to the cloud and wherever that we don't really oftentimes think about um, disk space, um, although I am because my computer's getting kind of full, but um, everything we store does take physical space. Um, it's just not in your house or in your office or on your computer, but it is taking space somewhere. 
And so the, the, anything we can do to reduce that space, to reduce the footprint of the data that we're keeping, um, can be beneficial. So I'm going to walk through a quick example of what a spreadsheet looks like. Because most people, if you're not familiar with the database, you probably have seen a spreadsheet. Um, this example is just four different locations. Um, we have addresses, a city, state, and postcodes. Um, if you look at that, we've got uh, four different addresses, four different cities, but only two different states, Missouri and Minnesota, and three different postcodes. The first one and the last one are the same. So this is very human uh, readable, human friendly. It's pretty easy to, because there's only a few of them, you can spot things pretty well, but you know, um, there are ways that we can turn this spreadsheet into a, a database. And the first step is we're gonna assign an ID to each of those essentially cells in the spreadsheet. So now we have an address that with an ID of one, and city with an ID of one, and state with an ID of one, and postcode with an ID of one. So we really haven't changed anything so far. It still looks a whole lot like a spreadsheet. Except at this point, we're gonna normalize that and take out those duplicates. We really only have to have Missouri and Minnesota in there once. We really only need each postcode to be in there once. So we just went from 16 cells in that database, 16 or in the spreadsheet, down to 13, which is a 20% reduction on a very small set of data. Um, so some of the savings in space can be pretty significant when you start talking about large amounts of data. Now that takes care of it being normalized, but then what about relational? We need to relate Birch Street to Greenvale. We need to relate Breezeway to Sandy Shores. We need to relate Sandy Shores to Minnesota. And Minnesota needs to be related to the two postcodes that are associated with it as well. So we have these relationships, one-to-one um, -one relationships. There is a Birch Street in Greenvale. There's only one Greenvale in Missouri. But we can also have what are known as many-to-one relationships, such as there, Minnesota has two zip codes. So we have one state with two zip codes. And so it's a matter of how you um, connect those things and relate those things that allow us to find what we're looking for as well as save that, that space. So if we go back to the spreadsheet where we started, again, very human readable, very human friendly. But if you look at like the number of characters there that are in white and just like the amount of white on that screen in that table compared to this, you can see how much less white there is there and how much more efficient a computer who d deals with numbers better than letters would be able to get through that. So now we basically still have those same four locations, but instead of saying Greenvale of, I can't even remember the names of the cities and states off the top of my head, um, but um, we have the lo first location being address one, city one, state one. Um, the third location being address three, city three, state two, postcode three. So it's a much more efficient, much smaller way of storing that data. But it's not, no longer a spreadsheet. It is now a database that has five tables. The first table is the one that looks the most like the spreadsheet. It's the one I just showed you. It has the links to the other data in the other tables. Um, it has an address table which contains each of the unique street addresses. And you might think, well, that would just be the same as what was in the spreadsheet, but it's possible to have two, one, two, three main avenues. One is in Missouri, one is in Minnesota. So now we only have to store one, two, three main avenue once in the street address database, but when we get back to those locations, now we say it's 123 Main Avenue in this city, in this state. So even addresses can become you know, uh, reduced. Cities has each unique, and unique is the important term here, unique city. Each city needs to be unique, but it should not be duplicated. States, 
you're probably all familiar with how these, the states works uh, in a database because if you've ever filled out a form online, you now have to select from the long list of states and sometimes the long list of countries as well because that is in a table in the database. And having worked with forms in the past that have not been in databases where people type in the actual name of the state and then you have to go and try and find everybody in the state, the typos and the capitalizations and the fact that they put the city in with the state or the zip code is now you know, the nine digit zip code rather than the five digit zip code and all of those types of things can make that kind of a nightmare. So that's why we have a, a table with each unique state that we can just choose from. And the same with the postcodes. Good forms actually ask you for your postcode and can tell you which city you live in. So now, again, that locations table is the same as that first spreadsheet, but it's just showing the locations in the other tables uh, where that data can be found. So the big question at this point, especially after lunch, why does any of that matter? Because this is the WordPress database, and these are the tables that are contained within it. There are 12 tables in the default install of WordPress. Uh, we are going to go through them at a very high level, very high level, of what they contain. And right now, that diagram that's up there might look like nothing to you. Maybe you've never seen it before. But by the time we get done, I'm hoping you'll understand a little more about how they're connected and what might be in there. But I do want you to notice one thing in this diagram, if you can. At the uh, bottom left and bottom right, there are actually two tables that do not have lines to the other tables. And the first one that's like that, is one at the bottom left, I believe, was, is WP Options. The WP Options table is one of the most important ones, in my opinion, um, in the WordPress database because it holds most of the site-wide settings, like the site's URL, the admin email, the theme that's active, uh, how many posts should be displayed on a, like an archive page, whether it's the default 10 or maybe dropped it to six or up to 25, um, the time format, um, date format, if you prefer month, day, year, or day, month, year, um, and, and image sizes. Uh, there are three usually default image sizes of thumbnail, medium, and large, and if you have any custom image sizes, those will be stored in WP Options as well. Um, some plugins and themes actually I'd also use the WP Options table to store some of their settings as well. So it, it can be more than just the WordPress default options. Then we're going to talk about the tables that are around posts that are in your uh, database, in the WordPress database. And when we talk about posts, it's really posts and pages and custom post types and a bunch of, act of other stuff actually that gets stored in the post table. I would argue that this is the most important table in the WordPress database. It has the most fields to it. It usually has the most data stored in it, the most records stored in it as well. Um, so things like the title of the post, the, the actual content of the post, uh, the time uh, that it was published or scheduled, um, any excerpt, the actual status, is it published or is it scheduled, um, are all stored in the posts, WP post database, or table within the database. The WP post meta table in the database contains metadata, data about data, about the posts and pages and custom post types that are stored in the WP posts table. Um, it can be things such as the page template that's supposed to be used with that type of post, um, old slugs that might be associated with the post, menu items, custom fields, um, and some plugins, uh, this is not a default, but some plugins use uh, the WP Most post meta table to store SEO information, uh, the keywords, uh, any snippets or um, featured images or whatever. So there we have two tables around posts. We also have two tables around contents, uh, or comments, excuse me. The first is the WP comments table, and this it might be the second largest table uh, in the database, certainly in terms of fields, I believe it's the second largest. It can either be the second largest, it can be empty, maybe you don't allow comments on your site, or it can actually be bigger than the WP posts file. If you have very few posts but a lot of comments, um, this could actually be the largest uh, chunk of data in your database. 
and it stores information about comments, including their author's name, the author's URL, the email, and the actual text of the comment, as you would expect in a comments table. The WP comment meta table stores metadata associated with a comment, such as the status of the comment, whether it's approved or pending, and any other sort of data about data uh, regarding comments. So the comments are kind of the in-between, sort of. These are all kind of connected. We have posts, we have comments, and then we have users, because users make comments that are attached to posts. Um, so we have users and, meta, and user metadata. WP users table stores information about users. Name, password, email, um, user status. Things that are associated with people, a person. The user meta contains meta information about users, including their user level. Are they a subscriber, an editor, an author, an admin uh, in the database? Um, and also anything that you might find on the My Profile section, uh, where things like um, the color scheme for the, for the admin dashboard, those types of things will be stored in the user meta as well. So those are the kind of really obvious tables, I guess. We have content in posts. We have comments in the comments table. We have users who make comments, so that makes sense. Then we also have terms, and this is a little more complicated, and I have to admit, I don't, I kind of wrestle with this because I don't really dig into it all that much, but there are actually four tables around terms and or taxonomies, if you want to call that. Um, so the, the WTP term taxonomy table stores information such as a taxonomy of, in this case, I'm going to use the example of age group. The WP terms are the actual terms. When you select a category or a tag, this is the actual tag or category you're selecting. So in this case, we have a term of uh, fifth grade, which is in the taxonomy of age group. Uh, additional data about the term. In this example, I'm saying that fifth grade also equals 10 years old. I'm not even sure if that's true, um, but as an example. And then the one that ties them all together is the WP term relationships table, which actually connects posts to the terms and the taxonomies and all of the things that we've, we've laid out here. So we're going to start with the WP term taxonomy table, which isn't very big. It's just got a few uh, fields in it, but it defines the taxonomies for terms in the WP terms table. In, this includes, this is the one that's going to talk about your, the categories, the tags, the custom taxonomies that you've defined for your WordPress site. And then there's the WP terms table, which is used to store the actual terms that are you're using your um, taxonomies. So if you have a category of news, WP terms is going to have the word news. Um, if you have a, a category of, I'm going to pick one out of the air here and just say pets, um, the terms that would be the taxonomy, and the term would be dog, or cat, or bird, or ferret. Um, and so this table is specific, it's storing specific terms that are associated with the taxonomy. WP term meta, it's a place to store metadata about the terms and taxonomies. Um, I have to admit it's empty in most of the databases, the WordPress databases I worked in, so I was kind of struggling to come up with an example for it. Uh, I do understand that WooCommerce will use it to store metadata about product attributes and categories, uh, but again, a lot of them databases or the sites I work with, there's really nothing in this table within the database. WP term relationships is what ties it all together. It manages the relationships between post types with terms in WP terms. So this is the one that says this post over here belongs to this cat, this term over here, this category. So this post has a category of dog, which is part of the taxonomy of pets. Ties them all together. It's where relational, we talked about that relational database. This one is pretty much all about what it says, relationships. And the last table in the de default WordPress installation database is the WP links uh, table. There's a fair amount of fields there, 
but honestly, it's been used, it was used by earlier versions of WordPress, and I don't really see it used a lot these days. Blog rolls haven't been a thing for a while, and every database I've ever looked at, this is an empty table. That doesn't mean it has to be. I mean, if you like blog rolls and want to use it for your own purposes, it's, it's there. But we keep it for backwards camp compatibility um, for those sites that are out there that do take advantage of WP links. So those are the default, the 12 default tables in the WordPress database. But sometimes there are other database tables as well. Because some plugins and themes will add their own tables to the database. And some plugins and themes will add a lot of tables to the database. They will actually add more tables to the database than what WordPress did. Um, I think I saw a random number this morning. I think WordFence drops in like over 20 tables. I, don't, I haven't tested that to, or counted that, but seems fair. I know that there are other ones that, that put in, like sliders even, will put in a half a dozen tables in the database. So is that good or is that bad? Like a lot of things, important questions in life, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, more tables are not necessarily bad. It's um, kind of like plugins. More plugins are not necessarily bad. It depends on how they're written. It depends on how they're coded. Um, it depends on how they're used. Um, but be aware that there are consequences when you have more tables to the, in the database. And I'll just give an example from my current job. <laughs> that I still have today, um, <laughs> where uh, I work with CoSchedule, which has a plugin that interacts with the WordPress, um, with WordPress sites. And we interact with custom post types um, if they're present in WordPress sites, as long as they're in the WP posts table. If you set up a custom post type and it goes into its own table in the database, we can't find it and we can't work with it. So is that good or bad? That depends on whether or not you want to work with CoSchedule. Um, but if you're not doing that then you want, and you want to keep it separate, then that's a good thing. So be aware that you may look at your database and actually find a lot more tables than the 12 I went through. And that's because plugins and possibly even themes have it. I've seen themes add uh, tables to the database because they have embedded, essentially embedded plugins into them. So these are the 12 um, default word tables in the WordPress database. Now if you look at this diagram this now, after we've gone through that. Again, I mentioned earlier that there are two tables in the bottom corners that are not related to anything else. But if you look at that center table, that is the posts. And if you look to the left, you start to see uh, the term, all of those tables, term relationships, term uh, WP terms, WP terms taxonomy, all of the term things there are related to posts. If you go up from posts in the center, you see users, because you can have users associated with posts. Somebody's got to have been the author. But users can also be associated with, well, first off, metadata, but also with comments. So off there on the right, you see comments, and then the metadata for comments. And then at the bottom, you have um, th those WP links for those blog roll links. So. Word of caution, because now that you've seen the database, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, knowing what's in the database and looking at what's in the database is something I really encourage you to do. Do not be afraid of looking at the database, but be very afraid of making changes to the database, um, you can, directly in the database. You can do some pretty significant damage by making changes directly in the database. Um, there are times when perhaps you actually do want to go directly in the database and make changes, but be aware that that is very dangerous ground. Um, so with great power comes great responsibility. It's out there. You can do that. But you may have to be like that previous slide of that poor guy out there in the middle of nowhere with a broken down car going, help, <laughs> help, what's gonna, can somebody fix my database? And the answer might be no, because you changed it. But again, I really do encourage you to take a look at what's in the database and understand how your database is put together and how it's, it's working. There are some resources um, that I used to put this slide show together, so if you'd like to see those. But what I'd really like to do now before we jump out is actually 
show you a database. No, nope, not that one. Let's start with this one. This is the raw, brand new install. Oh, it's not going to do this. Hang on. Let me find my display. There we go. All right. So this one is not the right one. Let's go with this one here. And I'll make it bigger. We're going to start by looking at the options table. This is the structure. I know it's small. Let me do something there, too. I just want to do that. Um, this is the actual structure of the WP options table. There are only four records or four fields up there, option ID, option name, option value, and auto load. They are different types. Each field has a type associated with it. One says BIG INT, big integer, variable character, long text, another variable character. So the, it, the structure of the table defines the data that can be put into the table as well. Another advantage of databases, to be honest. Here's the actual content that's in there. Again, I realize that this is way too small for pretty much anybody to read. But up there at the top, there is uh, the site URL, the home URL, the blog name, the blog description, um, you know, the tag. There are uh, the mail servers, the admin email is in here. The, down here at the template uh, up here is the active theme that you have going on. So this is that WP options table that's not really connected to anything else. This is the WP posts table. It goes on for a while, too. It's not forever, but for a while. This is where my actual WP post content is right here. These are my actual blog posts on this site all in one tiny little field. You think about that, you wrote this big, long blog post, put in all these images and captions and pull quotes and all those things, and it fits into this one little field in the database. Um, but it does. And so this might be some place that you would visit if you were trying to track down an error that just cannot be solved through the front end. Um, occasionally, things get wonky there. Um, the other table I wanted to look at is WP users. This one, the, the structure here, um, user login, user password, user nice name, user email, user URL, user registered, uh, which is a, a date time, user activation key, user status, and then the display name. So those are all the data that's stored about a particular person. But then this is the content. This particular one, again, is an off-the-shelf, uh, pretty default uh, install of uh, WordPress that has um, the theme review team's XML test content in it. So there's only five users. And my email is up here, and my password is here too. But notice they don't store the password in plain text. It is encrypted, um, and so you can't actually even go into the database and find people's passwords. Um, again, with great power comes great responsibility, and that's one of the things that they've chosen to make sure that they the, the core de uh, developers have made sure to be responsible with as well. So this is a very, very plain, and I'm just going to quick, uh, I will go through these just real quick to see what the default one. WP comment, comment meta is empty. WP comments, this one has a few comments, so you can see what those look like. Again, it's not, that's pretty much all of the data right there. The WP, oops, links table is empty. WP Options is the one we looked at earlier, and it does go on for a little while. Uh, WP Post Meta, this one, because of the test data in here, has a significant amount to actually of Post Meta. WP Posts, where all the posts are stored. Term Relationships, this is the one that just connects one thing to another. Remember those IDs? This one says this ID is connected to that ID. Connect those two things. Term Taxonomy, this is where it shows the categories has a description of the category. Post tag. Nav menu falls in here as well. Post format. 
term meta, this one's empty in this case as well. The terms, these are not empty. These are all the categories and tags. But notice in the term table um, that you can't actually see whether or not this is a category or tag unless you understand what the term group is that you're looking at. User meta and users. All right, so this was a plain Jane database. This one is not. This one is actually a website that, it's a local version of a website that is out there. And the first thing I want you to notice is how many more tables are in this database here on the left side. I've got everything from, I believe these might be backup tables. See, I don't even know. There's another thing to do. Go ahead and look at your database and see, how, see what's being stored there because as far as I'm concerned, these could probably all get deleted and I'd be fine. Um, we have uh, the WP Give plugin has, whoa, what a handful, half dozen or so tables there. NF3, that must be Ninja Forms, has some tables there. Revolution Slider has some tables in the database. So plugin and theme have added, matter of fact, that particular theme is not even active on this website, but it was installed at one time. It's not even installed anyway, just not even there. But when I installed it one time to test it out and see what it looked like, it dropped tables into the database and then did not remove them. So that is one reason to be familiar with what is in your database to see exactly what is in your database and whether or not you actually need it. Let's see if some of those empty ones have anything in here. WP post meta, a few things in there. Um, WP term meta, nope, that one's empty here. Term taxonomy has a few things. This is my age groups. Term relationships, again, is connecting things to each other. Terms has the actual terms. These are the ones that we are choosing from the drop-down lists. Posts, all the posts. Custom, oh, let me show you this real quick. I'm not sure if you can see it because it's so small. Where'd it go? I'm looking for post type. There we go, post type over here in, in this column over here. Um, you can see that actually it starts, this first one is a page, the second one is a revision. That's a whole nother record in the database because I changed something. Another page, revision, an attachment, ACF field group, ACF field, a lot of advanced custom fields um, happening in this site. So those are post types that are being stored in the default WordPress posts table. That particular uh, plugin chooses to store that data in the, in the default table. So you can see that post type can really involve a lot of things that you wouldn't expect. Attachments, revisions, nav menus, um, different uh, custom fields and custom post types. A um, lot of different things go into posts. So I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and open the floor for comments and see if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask about the database that I might have any clue to answer. I think they do want you to come up to the microphones because of um, it's being live recorded and so people in the back can hear you. So yeah, if you have a question, please come up to the microphones. Go ahead. Okay, the question is about WooCommerce and what, how it interacts with things. So my default install of WordPress, I didn't download WooCommerce, but I did not activate it. So let's go ahead and do that and see if we can actually see what it does to, ah, now we wanna set it all up. But let's see if it actually does anything to the database just by installing it. Okay, we do actually have to finish setting up. Uh, let's go US. I don't know, pick an address, there we go. Can 
continue, continue. I don't know. We're just going to continue until it says I have to. Five bucks for shipping. Yep, another one. Five bucks for shipping. Oh, I don't know if I want to do all of those things. Let's do none of those things right now. And let's skip that step for right now. Awesome. So if I go into my to create a product, I'm not sure I can answer your question based on this demonstration because you were asking about users. Right. Does anybody actually know the answer? Because I'm going to guess it can. That is why we use databases, so that it can grab that information from that table, because it, WooCommerce knows that the WP users table exists, and so it would make sense for it to connect it. Because I know if I log into my sites that I have Word, WooCommerce on, I might be the site admin. It knows that. It also knows that I'm like the store manager, so it knows that too, and that's all stored in one place. I mean, I can go into my profile and see both of that information there, so I'm guessing it does. Another question. Is there a uh, database for the statistics on the visitors to the site? Ah, good question. That would depend. <laughs> um, actually, that's probably Google. <laughs> um, usually, OK, throw it out to the crowd on that one, too. Does anybody know, have an answer for that one? The Jetpack? Jetpack might be storing visitors to the site. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking because every solution I can think of is involves a plugin with essentially a third party service um, that that data is probably being stored off site because like Google Analytics, I want to know if I want to know how many website visitors I have, I have to go to my Google um, Analytics to see that. Sometimes Google Analytics can be displayed within your WordPress site, but I don't believe the data is being stored there. I can almost guarantee the data is not being stored there because the data would be tremendous. And Google is holding that data, not your website. Are there any other questions? When you see that um, you've tried a plug-in and you decided you don't want to use it, but it left its stuff in the table, and you're like, I think I can delete this. Can you tell me, is there any reason you shouldn't delete it, or what you, should you be watching for? OK, all together now, one, two, three. What do you do first? Back up your database. <laughs> Got that. <laughs> um, yeah, if you back up your database and delete the, that's, matter of fact, now that I've noticed those tables, that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to back up the database and probably take those tables out and see what happens. And when the, when the site crashes, I'm going to restore from backup and go, OK, rather than trying to delete all of them at once, let's do it one table at a time and see where it is um, and, and go as far as I can to clean up my database. There are reasons you may want to clean up your database. Matter of fact, there are plugins that will clean up your database. Um, the first one that comes to mind is WP Optimize. Um, but uh, yeah, if, they, if there are things that are left behind and no longer using, they will start looking for that. So yeah, if you actually did want to go in and, and use that you know, great power and do some direct editing in the database, obviously you want to back up. And you want to know how to restore from your backup before you start messing with it. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Right here. Yeah, OK. Thank you. So why do um, plugin developers not remove their tables when, they, when, when you uninstall their plugins? I'm not a plugin developer, so you'd have to ask them. But I can guess that um, some, some plugin plugins actually do. There's a checkbox. Do you want us to delete everything from the database? Click here so that you are in control of whether you do or don't. Um, a, a lot of uh, the plugins that don't, I know that um, when you come back, when you reinstall that plugin, you're basically up and running again. So they may have made that choice that if we leave this stuff here and they want to come back, they don't have to start from scratch. Like WooCommerce, 
Um, I'm not done setting this up. It can take a bit to set up a WooCommerce store. So, you know, if you've done that, and I don't know how WooCommerce does this, haven't done it lately, but if I took WooCommerce out and said, I don't want that anymore, um, and it gets rid of all of that, then I have to start from scratch and do that all over again. So depending on the plugin and the developer, they may have made a choice to leave it in the database in case you ever reinstall the plugin. If you wipe the data, uh, if you choose if, for those options, that, if you have the option to wipe the data, does it wipe the tables as well? Use, yes, usually. It, that might be part of the choices it presents to you. And, but I would think, yeah, usually if they uh, get rid of the data, they're talking about getting rid of the tables. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna do like an encore because there's a couple of things that I'd like to show that, um, let's see if I can find it now, that nobody's asked about. Because there are some times when you actually would wanna be in the database. If you can't figure out your own password, you're the admin of the site, you have FTP access, you have access to the database, and you cannot remember the password you put on that site and don't have access to the email that you used. I mean, you did a typo or something and you can't find it. Sometimes it's just easier to go into the database and just reset the password. Um, so other times you might want to, you get into some weird redirect loop with the URLs. You went from a staging site to a live site or you changed the blog name or something and you just need to go in and say this is the domain for this site in both the site and the home fields and it's just sometimes easier to do that in the database. And sometimes you can um, track down weird things that are happening um, only through the database. It's like why isn't this category showing these things? and you actually start looking at the database and go, oh, yeah, I forgot that bit. So um, sometimes uh, troubleshooting, you wind up looking at the database trying to figure out what's happening with content. And then same with this whole verifying that a custom something or other is going where you want it to. For instance, we just were talking about does it use the users table? Go into the database and look. Um, does, uh, when you delete a plugin, does it delete the tables and, and data with it? Go in and look. So that might be a legitimate reason to go into the database and actually start um, making some changes. So there's one trick. This is my favorite reason to actually go into the database. It's usually when somebody's forgotten a password and doesn't have access to their email. You can go into the WP users table, into the user password field, and I showed you how they were encrypted earlier. Um, and you, so you can't just type in a password. Um, but the, if you type in a, an MD5 encrypted, you know, they call it a function uh, password, uh, MD5 hash generator will, will do that for you. You can type in your plain text password. It will give you the encrypted code that you can then put into your database and you should be good to go and reset your password. So that is the one, that's the most common reason I personally am in the WordPress database making changes. So I just wanted to leave you with that little trick before we wrap up here. I thank you for your attention, especially after lunch in a dark room with dark slides talking about a database. You guys did amazing. There were no loud snores. And um, I appreciate your questions as well. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.
This guy right in here, he's in the front. Sure. There you go. <laughs> that's your five, ten minute warning guy. <laughs> so thankfully I don't have to do both because that's <laughs> party. Okay, welcome, welcome. You're ready for your two o'clock session. Are you here for a technical SEO checklist? This is what this room is for. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone about WordFest tonight at seven, and that contributor day is on Sunday. So we hope to see all, if not most of you there. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Pam Ungst. And Pam is the owner of Pam and Art Marketing and Stealth Search and Anal Analytics. Both specialize in SEO, PPC, and analytics. She is a passionate advocate for WordPress and regularly gives talks at WordCamps around the country about SEO, Google Analytics, and business topics. Pam also has a personal, personal mission to talk openly about mental health and the importance of taking care of oneself in order to survive and thrive at work and at home. So everyone, please give a hand to Pam Unks for me. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I get to have you in the middle of the afternoon slump after you've eaten lunch and you're getting tired, but I'm going to try to make this technical dry stuff as, as exciting as possible. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about today, technical SEO. I am going to uh, start with a brief overview of why SEO is important and why technical SEO in particular is very important. I'm also going to walk you through a condensed version of my technical SEO checklist, which the full thing is very, very long. It's, it's got 50 different categories of things on it with kind of subtopics under that, so it's very, very long. So I'm giving you a condensed walkthrough today, but I will also give you a link to the full spreadsheet to download the audit uh, template that I use with every little thing on it when I audit a site for these technical things. So let's get right to it. I've got a lot of information to go over, so I want to make sure that I go kind of quickly here and, and we'll wait on questions till the end, but I'll definitely get to everyone's questions at the end. Um, fortunately, the break is right after this as well, so I won't run away afterwards if we don't get to all the questions formally in the session. But here we go. All right, so why is SEO important? I feel that search engines, unlike other digital marketing channels, are the most powerful place to get found by a potential customer because these users are specifically sitting down or you know, tapping in on their phone on a scope. They're specifically going to a search engine because they are seeking something that they want either now or soon. They want or need it now or soon. That's such a high level of intent to transact and do business. You really can't find that in any other digital marketing channel. I mean, social media ads and all sorts of behavioral ads are out there that have great targeting that make it so that you can be pretty sure you're getting in front of the right person, but it's not necessarily the right time that they want or need something. So search engines are just unmatched in the level of intent to buy that these users have. So that's why I feel that SEO is important. Now let's talk about why technical SEO is particularly important. Uh, that requires a quick primer on how search engines work first. So I'm going to go through that really fast. Search engines perform three basic steps in order to produce search results. The first is that they crawl the internet. They send a software program, often called a bot, or a robot, or a you know, crawler, Google bot, Bing bot, whatever it's called. It's a software program that goes out and crawls from link to link on the web just to discover all the different content that's out there. There's hundreds of trillions of pages. So they first have to crawl it and just find it all. After that, they index it, meaning they take a copy of the content on the page and store it in their own databases. That's what gets searched against, and that's necessary to produce search results quickly. So first they crawl it, discover what's out there, then they index it, which is collect a copy of it. Then they can rank or sort the results in ordered results. So crawl, index, rank are the three steps that search engines do to produce search results. But technical SEO is so important because if it, it makes it so that search engine crawlers can access your site, can crawl it, and can take a copy of it and index it and put it into the search engine. It can't rank you, you can't show up if it can't do those two things. So you could have the most beautiful, awesome site on the web. You could have the best content on the web. If a search engine crawler program cannot access or understand your site, that doesn't matter. You will not show up at all. So that's why I feel that technical is like the foundation of SEO. It's the most important thing that should be looked at first. And I'm going to go through how to look at some of the most important things. So here we go. We're going to start with some basic slash traditional things. The people always say that SEO is changing all the time, but I don't think that it's necessarily changing. It's just getting more and more complex. I always say that Google is always just like adding to the already long list of hoops it wants you to jump through uh, when they come out with something new and another something new and another something new. So the basics have not changed. There's a lot layered on top of it now, but the basics haven't changed. So we're going to start with that. My first tip to everyone is always that their website should be run on a well-supported open source platform like WordPress. I do link to an article uh, here that explains more about why I say that, but I don't have to sell you on WordPress. You're all at Word <laughs> WordCamp US, so you're already fans. Um, so I don't need to convince you how great it is. But if you're curious to read it, um, I will give you a link to download these slides later at the end, and then you can read that article. But we're all fans of WordPress here, so moving on. As much of a fan of WordPress as I am, I absolutely love WordPress, I adore it, I advocate for it all the time. 
there is one thing that drives me nuts about it, which is this checkbox here that I refer to as the checkbox of death. Uh, formally, it's called the search engine visibility checkbox. It's in the WordPress reading settings, and it so very often gets forgotten about and is left checked when a site launches or a redesign of a site launches. If I had a nickel for every single time that happened and I had a client come to me and say, why is my website not in search engines anymore? And I find that it's just that checkbox is checked, I, I'd have a lot of nickels. Um, but it bothered me so much that I actually uh, decided to co-author a plugin to monitor for this. I actually needed to as an SEO agency because I'm responsible for making sure that my clients' websites don't suddenly fall out of search engines, and they will if someone accidentally checks the box. So created cross-check uh, SEO visibility monitoring plugin to send out email alerts if that checkbox is checked on a production site. Uh, pretty simple, uh, but incredibly important. Going to be on the WordPress plugin directory soon. For now, it can be uh, downloaded at crosscheckseo.com. So must make sure that search engines are allowed to access your website and uh, make sure the checkbox of death is not checked. Similarly, there's one other thing that can completely kill your search engine visibility, and that's a disallowed directive for the entire website in the robots.txt file. Now, it's a SEO basic best practice to have a robots.txt file. Uh, it, what it does is it tells search engine crawlers what they are allowed to and not allowed to crawl. And that comes in really handy because there's certain pieces of content on the site you probably don't want showing up publicly in a search engine. So here's where you can say, I don't want this page or this section or this subdirectory allowed to be in search engines. And I want to allow everything else. So you see the last uh, line on there is allow slash. The slash alone means everything else on the site. But if you accidentally, or if a plugin sets that line instead of allow slash to disallow and just a slash, your entire website is now blocked from search engines, the same way as if your checkbox of death was checked. So got to make sure that that doesn't happen either. And it does happen by accident. I have a, a client that. They, they have a really good workflow where they, they only post changes to their website on staging, and then they have everybody internally QA it and double check it before they push it live. But something in their process is broken in that every time they push it live, they overwrite their robots file with the staging one, which says, disallow this whole site. And so they kept dropping out and dropping out. I found myself manually checking their website every single day. So again, the cross-check plugin will uh, monitor for that and alert you by email if there's a disallowed directive for the whole site in the robots file. So those two things, the checkbox of death and the robots file, are two things that are of utmost importance because they will completely exclude you from search engines in totality if they are not configured correctly. So. If you've attended to those two things, now you're sure that you can be in search engines. There's plenty of other things you can and should do to make sure that your site is very search engine crawler friendly, one of which is an XML sitemap. An XML sitemap is uh, sort of like a table of contents. It's a, it's a techie file. It exists just for search engine crawlers, not for humans to use. But um, it's basically a table of contents of all the content that's on your site that you do want indexed. and a a lot of SEO plugins will take care of this for you. I'm a big fan of Yoast. I've just used it forever, and it just works really well. So um, I'm sure there's other plugins that can do it, but I use Yoast, and it generates the XML sitemap. And all you have to do then is, once it's generated, is submit it to Search Console. If you haven't heard of Search Console, it's a free tool by Google, sort of similar to Google Analytics, but it's different in that Google Analytics monitors the uh, user activity on your website. Google Search Console monitors the technical health of the website as it pertains to Googlebot, the search engine crawler. So it's all information about like errors that the search engine crawler encountered when trying to crawl and index your website. So that is the most uh, important SEO tool you could possibly ever use. Uh, if you do nothing else today, if you get nothing else from this talk, at least set up Search Console for your site so that you can find out. And that's the only place that Google will communicate directly with you on if they are having issues crawling or indexing, including your site in search results. So that's incredibly important to set up Search Console. 
Anyway, once you have an XML sitemap, you do want to submit it to Search Console. Search engine crawlers will probably find your XML sitemap eventually anyway, but it's a really good idea to just submit it directly there, and it will tell you if there's any errors in it. So that's another reason to submit it, make sure that they can process it correctly. OK, so I said the XML sitemap is not for humans, so you also do want to have a sitemap for humans uh, that is like a HTML, regular old page, an outline of all the pages on the site. And that actually is not just for humans. It's very human friendly, but it's also for search engine crawlers to gain an understanding of the hierarchy of the pages on the site, what's nested under what. So that has been shown to increase crawlability rates if you have a, an HTML sitemap as well. It could just be linked to in the footer, like in the example here. But it should be dynamically generated and updated. So if you add a new page at any point in time, you won't have to remember to come back and add it here. You can just have it dynamically updated. And plugins are available to do that. The one I've been using most often lately is called WP Sitemap Page. And that's linked to from the slides here. And it makes an easy little short code for you to uh, use to dynamically generate an outline of all your pages that will stay up to date. And you can put that in your sitemap page and then just link to it from the footer. So those are two types of sitemaps. I'm going to go jump around a little bit here with other technical tips. Uh, one is pretty simple regarding one page designs. People also often ask me, you know, those websites that are just like one big long page and they have a, a main nav like home about whatever, but it really just hops down to a lower part of the page. Don't do that. If you want to be in search engines, just don't do that. Yes, there are ways to work around that you can put in place to make it kind of look like separate pages on the back end to the search engine crawlers, but it's workarounds. It's, it's not a good solution. Search engines prefer that sites have actual separate pages, so just, just don't do that. Next up, breadcrumbs. This is something you should do. Breadcrumbs, similar to the HTML sitemap, are, they help uh, search engines understand the structure and the hierarchy of a website, especially if they're marked up with schema markup. Schema markup is, uh, if you don't know what that is, it refers to additional code that you can add behind the scenes of your website. One of the only things that you can kind of like do behind the scenes that's still okay. <laughs> You're usually not allowed to hide stuff uh, behind the scenes in the code of a website anymore, but schema is okay. Additional code, add behind the scenes. Humans don't see it, but search engine crawlers do. And what it does is it gives context to each piece of information so that search engine robots can understand the information that they're crawling with like artificial intelligence and machine knowledge. It can actually understand what these numbers and letters mean. So the example schema code there is basically telling the search engines this is a breadcrumb, and this is the first page in the breadcrumb, and this is the second page in the breadcrumb and so on, so it understands perfectly clearly what it's crawling. And Yoast can also help with this. It will not only generate the breadcrumb for you, uh, it will also generate the schema markup. So that can be pretty easy to implement. Next up, um, I put this under the category of technical because it does kind of uh, have to be tended to when you're putting the site together or redesigning a site. You want to make it extremely easy for your website visitors to find and follow your presence on social media. There is a correlation. Google's very careful to say it's not a causation, but there is a correlation between content that gets shared a lot on social and content that ranks high in search engines. So you do want to make sure that your content gets shared on social as much as possible by yourself and others. So make it just very clear with share buttons and follow buttons clearly labeled which are which. Share buttons here, follow buttons here. Um, on the website, so just make sure to include that in your design. You also want to make sure to show dates on blog articles. This is a, an item of great debate but in the SEO world, but whenever there's an item of great debate in the SEO world, I fall back on what Google is actually saying, their representatives, their employees, kind of straight from the horse's mouth information, and they keep saying you should have dates on your blog articles. And not only do they say that, they say that you should also show the original published date in addition to the last modified date. So they do encourage you to update your content and keep it fresh and up to date and relevant, but they don't want you to change the original date. They want you to leave the original published date as is and then show the last modified date. Now, last modified date is a field that's already in the database in, in WordPress, but it's not often shown on blog articles. So this plugin here, WP Last Modified Info, is a plugin that can help you show it. There's a variety of ways to show it, but that's, that's a plugin that might be able to help you show the last modified date. 
Oh, and on, uh, if you have any content that's like white papers, case studies, more evergreen content, it's totally fine to leave dates off of those, but you do want to have an author name on them, and I'll talk more about why uh, shortly. Okay, jumping around again. URLs, you want to make sure to have search engine friendly URLs. Um, that's really easy in WordPress. You just set your permalinks to post name, and that's pretty much it. And when you're creating your slugs, just try to avoid underscores. And when you're implementing plugins and extra functionality, just try to avoid parameters if you can. It's not a big deal if you can't avoid them, but if you can come up with a way to do something without using parameters, all the better. Title tags are one of the most important things in SEO, tells the search engines the topic of a page. So they should contain good keywords that people often search, that you use like a keyword research tool to, to verify that people do often search those keywords. And you want to have them in your title tags. Any SEO plugin can help you manage this. Again, I, I just have used Yoast forever, so I use Yoast. Uh, but one thing to note is that I, I don't feel like you should have the site title in there. So by default, when you install Yoast, it puts the page name in the title tag, and it lets you modify that, but it then automatically appends the name of the website to the end of the title tag. And that's really just using kind of valuable real estate in the title tag and sort of diluting the percentage of match between what a user types in as, as far as keywords go and what keywords you have in the title tag. So I like to remove site title, and you can do that site-wide um, on each type of content in the Yoast search appearance settings. Okay, flying through, because we have limited time. Images should contain alt text. This is uh, both an SEO item and a, an accessibility item. Um, search engines, as well as screen readers that uh, people who have trouble seeing use to read website content to them, neither of those can understand what an image is unless you put words to the image. So the alt text field exists. Uh, you'll see it in WordPress as soon as you upload an image. It's just alt text will be blank. You can fill it out with a description of the image. It should be an accurate description of the image. And if you can, try to use the keyword for that page, the focus or primary keyword that you've been trying to optimize that page for uh, in the image alt text. But what's of utmost important is that it's an accurate description of the image. So if you can't do that, that's fine. Okay, meta descriptions are another thing that's really good to uh, make sure that you have on each page. And again, just about any SEO plugin can help you implement these, uh, including Yoast. They are not a ranking factor. Um, they will not make a certain page rank higher. What they are is that preview of text, that excerpt of text underneath the search engine results. So when you Google something and it gives you a little preview, that's a meta description. And it's really good to have because it encourages people to click through to your result. So it's not something that's gonna make you come up higher, but it's gonna make you, it's something that's gonna make you get more out of your SEO efforts because basically it's like an opportunity to write a little ad for the page. It's like ad copy, a short uh, description of the page content that is compelling. You tell people what they're gonna get out of visiting that page and that increases click-through rates, which increases SEO traffic. All right, next up, broken links are another item of great debate, just about everything is in SEO. Um, but it, broken links are not uh, a ranking factor. I don't, I don't argue that. That's what people argue back and forth. Are, are they a ranking factor? They're not a ranking factor, but I feel like they absolutely matter for SEO because what a broken link is is a dead end for both human users and search engine crawlers, and that is not a good thing. Um, search Console specifically will report on broken links because Googlebot hit a dead end uh, when they tried to crawl the website. That's just never a good thing. So make sure you monitor your website for broken links and that you fix them with 301 redirects when they occur. And if you're redesigning a website, make sure that all URLs, even the older ancillary ones that you may not be thinking about, are redirected upon launch and monitor. Um, I, I also use Screaming Frog to crawl a site for on-site broken links, but also monitor broken links in Search Console because someone else on the web could be linking to you and have a typo or they're linking to you and you changed that URL. Those external links are of huge value for SEO, so you don't want to lose those. You want to make sure to monitor Search Console very carefully so that you don't lose any of those. You fix them all with redirects. And there's also this broken links plugin I like to use uh, called Redirection by John Godley. It will help you do 301 redirects really, really easily. Just old URL, new URL. 
that's all you have to put in. You can even do some advanced settings so that if you change the name of a page, it will automatically create a URL, a, redir a 301 redirect for you. So I like that one. Also on the topic of broken links, you want to make sure to have a custom 404 error page that has human-friendly language for if your humans hit a dead end on your site and you can direct them where they may want to go next. But also including links on this page has been shown to improve crawl rates. So that because when a search engine crawler hits a broken link, if they hit a 404 page that's got a bunch of other links on it, it can keep going, it can keep crawling, it won't stop. So that's really good for SEO to have at least like a high level outline of pages of your site on your custom 404 error page. All right, next up, security. Uh, this is a pretty simple concept. Google does not want to, and I keep referencing Google, I just want to clarify that Bing follows basically everything Google does. <laughs> if Google comes out with something new, Bing has it in a couple of weeks. So everything I'm saying about Google is because they're the, the leader of the pack, but it all applies to other search engines as well. Um, so search engines, not just Google, don't want to include uh, content in their search results that has malware on it. That's pretty simple. They wouldn't want to guide their users into getting hacked or anything. Um, but it can be incredibly difficult to know that you have malware on your site. Um, even some of the online scanners will miss certain types of uh, malware and, and hacked content on a site that's deep enough buried in the code or the database. So uh, follow all the best practices. This is a whole other talk in and of itself is website security, but just if you get an opportunity to check out a talk on that, do, because it's really important for SEO. And also you wanna make sure to use SSL. If you haven't already, most sites have this already, but if you don't, um, the way to make sure is that your website loads with HTTPS and not just HTTP. Uh, most hosts include that for free now, or if they don't, you can even get a free SSL certificate from a website called Let's Encrypt and that will make sure that you have that SSL security on your site. Okay, now first, those were all basic things that have not changed over the years. Some more recent and advanced stuff is what I have coming up here. You wanna make sure your website is responsive. I think most people are aware of this by now. Around April of 2015, we had mobile Geddon, where Google really put their foot down about, you have to have a mobile-friendly website. And so a lot of people made a mobile-friendly website at that point in time. But what they've clarified over the years is that they really want you to be responsive, not like a separate mobile site or a separate mobile subdomain like m.yourdomain.com. They really don't want you to do that. They finally were super clear on that just recently. They, they want you to do responsive. And they also want you to do responsive their way. <laughs> they have guidelines uh, for, Google has guidelines for uh, how with your font size is, how far apart your tap targets should be, all sorts of things. Um, so you want to run your site through the Google Mobile Friendly Test to make sure that it meets all of those more finicky requirements. So being, just being responsive isn't enough. You have to be responsive in the way that Google thinks you should do it. There's also a report in Search Console called the Mobile Usability Report, and that will tell you additional information about what Google thinks of the mobile friendliness of your pages. I think the last stat I heard was that like 65% of searches on Google are performed on mobile now. So they're like just obsessive about mobile. Actually, they changed the whole um, indexing process to be mobile first, meaning that if you have a desktop version and a responsive version of your website, in the past, Google would primarily crawl the desktop version and kind of judge you based on that, that. Now they're mobile first, so they will judge you first and foremost on your mobile version of your website when it comes to how good uh, they think you are for inclusion in search results. So mobile's super important. Staying on the topic of mobile, Google invented this thing called AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages is what it stands for. A very oversimplified and not completely te technically accurate way to describe it is that it's like another layer of responsive. So you have normally on a, a website, I've got a demonstration here. Um, so this is my website in responsive version, which basically just kind of reorders and squishes and stacks the same stuff that's on the page into a phone size screen. But over there is the AMP version of the same page. AMP really strips it down. Like it strips out a lot of the design and styling and JavaScript, and they do that so that um, it loads lightning fast. And actually, if you have an AMP version of a page, 
when someone's searching on their phone in Google and your result comes up, you'll get a little lightning bolt icon next to your result, kind of promising the user that this page is going to load lightning fast. So that is something that uh, can be a benefit, for sure, to implement. Um, it can be easy for certain types of content, and it's not so easy for other types of content. Basically, it's pretty easy in most cases to implement it on blog posts. Blog posts are just basically mostly text, not a lot of heavy design elements in them. So it's really easy to use the official AMP for WordPress plugin, which I have linked to here, uh, to simply slap AMP onto your blog posts. Now, if you want to do it on pages, it's a lot trickier. It's good to do it if you can. Um, my formal recommendation to my clients is at least do it on blog posts. I'm not sure the cost benefit is there to do it on pages because it can be so much harder to get things like forms and certain design layouts working on, on AMP. Um, but if you want to try it, I would recommend a different AMP plugin. The AMP 4WP uh, plugin is much more robust when it comes to options for integrating with form plugins and doing all sorts of advanced stuff that you may have to do if you're going to try to get all of your pages into AMP. Now, regardless of what plugin you use to implement AMP, something very, very, very important to know is that AMP does not automatically carry over, the AMP version of a page does not automatically carry over your Google Analytics code. And so I see this happen a lot. People don't realize that, they implement AMP, and then all of a sudden, their traffic looks like it's dropping in Google Analytics. It's not actually dropping. It's just that there's no Google Analytics tracking code on the AMP version of the pages. So that is important to implement separately. It has to be in a completely different format than your typical Google Analytics script. Um, but both of those plugins that I mentioned have a specific setting screen that makes it fairly simple to add your Google Analytics code there. But definitely don't skip that step. Another step not to skip when implementing AMP is to make sure your AMP page is valid. Uh, AMP specifications are weird. <laughs> it's not like regular um, website coding. So you got to make sure that the pages validate in Google's AMP testing tool, which is linked to there. Another mobile thing that's very important is not to have what Google considers intrusive pop-ups. There's a specific penalty for this, the mobile, inter I can never say this word, mobile interstitial <laughs> penalty. Uh, basically, it's about pop-ups. Uh, they don't want you to have pop-ups that are not user-initiated that cover the main content of the page. So there's examples there on what they feel are intrusive and unreasonable versus what they feel is reasonable. So basically you can have like a banner that's maybe, you know, 25% of the page come up at the top that doesn't keep the user from reading the body content. But if you have something like that first one where it's just, you know, a box, uh, taking up a majority of the page and in the middle so people can't read, they don't like that and uh, you can get kind of demoted in search engine results for that. Another thing that is important to avoid is duplicate content. Now, there's not a specific penalty for this. Like I said, there is a penalty for the mobile pop-up thing. There's not a specific penalty for duplicate content, but it's not good because search engines don't want to show two copies of the same page in their search results. So they're basically just going to ignore additional copies. And sometimes they ignore the copy that you want shown. Um, so you want to make sure you don't have uh, two different URLs displaying the same or very, very similar content. Uh, similarly, you don't want to have different pages using the same title tags, the same meta descriptions, or the same H1 tags. Um, there's some tools here that are good for identifying duplicate content. Unfortunately, there's not kind of like an all-in-one. Um, different ones do different pieces of this. So Screaming Frog will help you check for duplicate meta tag content. It will tell you, tell you how many duplicate title tags you have, H1 tags you have, meta descriptions you have, et cetera. Sightliner is a tool that will tell you if you have like the body copy, like the meat of the page, if you have two different URLs uh, with same or two similar content in the body of the page. And Copyscape checks for duplicate content between a page on your website and elsewhere on the web, because that's also considered duplicate content. It's not just two URLs within your site having same or similar content. It's also other URLs on the web, and Copyscape will check for that. All right, so you also want to check for duplicate content in Search Console's 
coverage report uh, under the excluded category, Google will tell you if they ignored a page because they considered it a duplicate. Now, if you can't get away from having two pages, two URLs that have the same or similar content, that's not necessarily a problem. You just need to mark one of them as the original with something called a rel canonical tag. And SEO plugins like Yoast can help you set that up. This way you have control over which is shown in search results and which is ignored. You also want to avoid duplicate content by making sure that your website only loads one way when it comes to the you know, HTTP or HTTPS or the www version or the non www version. You just want to make sure they all redirect to one that starts with HTTPS. And then it doesn't so much matter if it has a www or not, but you just you don't want it to load independently both ways. You want to force them all the different ways someone might type it in to redirect to one way. And there's a tool called httpstatus.io where you just put in your domain name and check that canonical domain check button, and it will tell you if it's all good or not. All right, if you are using Yoast, this is a tiny little thing that probably isn't an issue, but they did have one update where this was turned to no by default, which it should not be, and that's uh, media attachment redirects. You want to make sure this is set to yes. It probably is. They fixed it in later releases, but once in a while I still come across a site that has that set to no, so that's just a quick double check. Okay, so before I mention author names on content, this is another thing that Google has been talking a lot about lately that is of great debate, as per usual, in the SEO industry. But again, I just default back to whatever Google tells me to do, I'll do. So they say you should have author names on your content. Um, not necessarily every page, but like thought leadership content, blog articles, white papers, et cetera. You want to show who wrote them, and you want to show how credible that person is. So you want to show a bio for that person. Um, you can have like a short little bio at the bottom of the page. I use a plugin called Starbucks, Star, Starbucks, <laughs> Starbox. <laughs> I need coffee, obviously. Uh, Starbox to add a little blur bio blurb, like a short bio about me to the bottom of my blog articles. And then in there, I have a link that links through to a full bio with even more information on why I know what I'm talking about. And then also on the full bio page, I also used schema markup. I'll give you more information about how to implement schema in a moment. But I also implemented schema markup so that Google can understand that I am a person. I have you know, a degree and a job title and a description, and I have all sorts of other things that I marked up in my bio so that, again, they can use uh, artificial intelligence, machine knowledge of sorts to understand w more about me as an entity. That's a big thing in SEO these days. They're trying to not just match keywords, but understand entities. Like an entity could be a company or a person or a thing, an object, whatever it may be. They're, they're trying to understand entities. So this helps them understand that I am a person, I have all these credentials, and I wrote the article at hand, which makes it more trustworthy. Another thing they talk about all the time now is EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. You want to demonstrate that as best you possibly can on your thought leadership content. And this having a bio and marking it up a schema is a good way to do that. Another super important thing that Google talks a lot about lately is that your website should load fast, which you may feel like it does, um, especially on mobile, they're picky about this, but you're probably on like a Wi-Fi or a 4G LTE type of connection where you're like you know, 12, 18 megabits per second on average. They want your site to load <laughs> quickly on a uh, 1.6 megabits per second 3G internet connection, which is super slow connection, but they want to make sure that your website loads fast on mobile on that connection. So there's a tool, um, well, first I'll give you a plugin, and then I'll give you testing tools. Uh, the plugin I like for all things page speed related is WP Rocket, simply because it covers almost all things page speed related. You can accomplish what WP Rocket accomplishes with a mix of other plugins, but WP Rocket just makes it easy because it's all in one. But it is paid, so you can um, implement this in a free way with other plugins. But uh, first you want to test what Google thinks of your site speed, and they have a tool called Page Speed Insights, and that will tell you how fast your website loads on that super slow, 
3G 1.6 megabits per second connection. And they'll give you a score on a scale of 0 to 100. Don't worry about getting a 100. That's not what's important. But you don't want to be in the red. You don't want to be in that danger zone. They, they color code the, the scores, the red, yellow, and green. Just make sure you're definitely not in the red and get it as close to green as you possibly can. Another great tool for speed testing is GT Metrics. Uh, it's uh, free. You can, you, you, you can log in. Um, create a free account to log in and set a bunch of different settings, like whether you want to test with desktop or mobile in different locations and whatnot. And it gives you a lot of information about every little thing on the page and how long it's taking to load. So you can troubleshoot further uh, why your website's not loading too quickly. And similarly, WebPageTest, webpagetest.org, is another great tool, even more settings for emulating different conditions, different browsers and whatnot when you're doing your speed testing. It gives you a ton of information. So those are very helpful. All right, a couple of random tips about scripting. Um, when JavaScript is disabled, you want to make sure that your content is still visible and crawlable. Now, this is, uh, this is becoming less important because Google's getting a lot better at reading and rendering JavaScript, but it's still kind of clunky the way they do it. So you want to make sure that if JavaScript's disabled, the most important uh, words on the page are still visible. You also want to make sure that Google can crawl everything. They want to crawl all of your CSS, all your JavaScript, basically everything, unless it's a page you don't want uh, included in search results. And other random tips, iframed text and obviously Flash are incredibly search engine unfriendly. So it's OK to use iframes for like putting a video in or something, but don't like iframe whole pages worth of text into another page. I'm going to speed up a little bit here to make sure we have a few moments for questions. Um, so I mentioned schema a couple times now, and schema is, is complicated. It's, it's simple in theory. In theory, it's just additional code you put on the behind the scenes on the website to give further context to the information for understanding it with machine knowledge. But it can be really tricky to implement. Um, you can view the guidelines for each type. Of, all, you can view the different types of schema that are available and the guidelines for how to implement each on schema.org. That's the central place where all the guidelines are published. Um, and certain things I, I recommend making sure you have. There's all sorts of types of schema that you can use. But at a minimum, I like to see uh, company names, addresses, and phone numbers, videos, articles, author bio pages, products if it's an e-commerce site, um, and, and any other type of schema that applies to you. But those are a few to consider as a minimum. And so since it's kind of tricky to implement, it is uh, easiest to rely on plugins for this. Uh, the first one, Schema by Hesham, is one that's pretty easy to help you implement basic types of schema. Uh, there's another one, WPSchema.com, or is, uh, well, the name of the plugin is Schema Pro. That is, uh, it's a paid one, but it's super user friendly. It's very, very easy to use. So I like that one also as an alternative to the first one. And then for video schema specifically, I absolutely love this plugin, WP YouTube Lite, L Y T E. It, um, connects to your YouTube channel. You have to do a quick thing where you get an API for your, an API key for your YouTube channel. But once you do that, it connects to your YouTube channel and then any videos you upload to YouTube and then embed in your site, it automatically generates the video schema for. Super handy. Otherwise, you have to remember to do that manually every single time you add a video. And very important with schema, similar to AMP, you want to make sure that all of your schema markup validates. You do have to do it correctly with the, the nesting of the different properties and whatnot. So there's something called uh, the structured data testing tool that Google has that you can just put a URL in or some code and see if your schema is done correctly. One quick bonus tip, and then I'll give you the link to the full uh, audit template of even more things that I check for technical SEO audits. Um, bonus tip for local businesses, uh, local businesses meaning like any entity that needs to attract search engine users from a certain geographical radius, like a pizza place or, or a plumber is not going to go beyond a certain radius. Um, if you have a business like that, you want to make sure that all of your, your physical office locations that you have a real street address for are, have their own individual pages and that you embed a uh, link to the, or embed a Google map that is linked to the Google My Business uh, map for Google My Business. Google Maps listing for that business, which is managed by Google My Business. They love to rename things like that all the time. 
And mark your company name, address, and phone number up with schema markup. That's very, very important for local businesses. So to make sure that search engine crawlers understand uh, where exactly geographically you're located. And search is very localized, especially on mobile. So um, you want to make sure to have schema markup on your address. And if you have multiple addresses, have them all on different pages and embed your Google Maps uh, listing on each. OK, so a couple minutes for questions. And then we are going into break after this, and I'm not running away. Um, but I want to point out where you can download the uh, slides and the checklist, which includes all these things I went over today and even more. Uh, it's crosscheckseo.com slash download. You can download both of those things there. And we'll take a couple questions now, and then I'm happy to chat with anyone else either immediately after this, or you can tweet me. We can meet up another time this weekend if you want more personalized one-on-one -on -one help. Yes? Oh, sorry. We were supposed to use a microphone. <laughs> Is it working? Hello? There we go. OK. Um, I guess it's in Search Console. You'll get sometimes an error message or a, an email saying they've done your, your site and it found some things like buttons are too close together or text isn't too big. Well, that's not terribly helpful in the sense of, well, how big is the button supposed to be? And how big is the text supposed to be? And how far apart are we talking? A certain number of pixels, or where is that written down? Or yeah, I agree. They're uh, a bit vague when they send out those notices. A um, couple things to note about that. So I mentioned the mobile usability reports in Search Console. Uh, that's what those emails are related to. So it's telling you you have a mobile usability error. As of late, there's actually been a lot of false positives going out in that. So I see a lot of emails going out, and then I test the page with the mobile-friendly test, and it's fine. So those tend to self-resolve. So first thing is just double check. Well, that's what I've, because I'll have customers, because it sends it to them too, and they say, hey, what's going on? I'll go back and look, and yeah, everything yeah. seems fine. So. Yeah, I've been meaning to, uh, to reach out to John Mueller of Google about that, because he's the one that works most closely with Search Console, and it is so annoying. Um, so first, just use the mobile-friendly test and verify that there actually is or is not an issue. And if there is, they do publish the guidelines on exactly what the font sizes should be and the spacing and all of that. Um, I don't have the link handy, but I could send it to you if we okay. connect. They do okay. put it, lay it all out somewhere. All right, thank you. Certainly. Um, I have two questions. The first question is uh, about a slide you just had. Uh, when embedding the schema for our company, is it appropriate to do it for all pages, or is there a certain page that we should put it on? Ah, very good question. I should have mentioned that when it comes to schema, it's very important to make sure that the markup that you're adding to a page matches the actual human vis view, view <laughs> human visible <laughs> content on the page. So you want to add it to only pages that show your address. So okay. if you have your address in your footer, and then your address legitimately is viewable by humans on every page, you can add the schema to every Perfect. page. But if your address is only on your contact page or something, then only add the schema there. Okay. It's, it's very important to make sure that the schema markup you add relates to something that actually does exist okay. on the page. My second question, um, other than for page load speed, does, it, uh, does CDN or server location have any impact on page ranking? Not separately from page load time, but both of those things very much affect right. page load time and, in turn, SEO. OK. Thank you. Certainly. Hello. Hi. Uh, Follow-up question to that. So if you don't have a physical address, do you, what would, what would you suggest to do about the schema markup? Good question. If you don't have a physical address, um, you still, if it's important to only attract users from a certain region, like you may not have a physical address because you serve clients nationwide and you work from home, like then you don't really need to worry about this too much. But if you are a local business, you only, you know, you do something in person, you only go to a certain mile radius, um, at least mark up the city, state, and zip. 
you know, or if a, a county, if you, you know, if you want to use a county, like give as much of that as you can. So maybe you won't have the street address piece, but you could list your city, state, zip, or your county and your state and uh, mark that up with schema. So you would say if you're an information product company that sells globally that you wouldn't need schema? You wouldn't need to focus on trying to make it clear to search engines where exactly you, you are geographically located. Um, that can be an advantage in one way because it might boost you in that region, but in another way it can be a disadvantage because it can kind of um, pigeonhole you into Google thinking that you only serve that region. So you don't want to focus on it too much if you're nationwide. Thank you. Certainly. Okay, so I've got to wrap up this formally, but I'm not running away. Happy to answer any questions during this break now, or if you want to meet up and actually sit down and go over an issue with me, just tweet me. Thank you, everyone.
Must be showtime. I have an intro. Awesome. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome everyone. Just wanna make sure you all know you're in the right room. This is the Hacking Mindset talk. So you got two more talks. We have a wonderful speaker coming up, but before I do that, my name is Aida and I'll be your room MC. I just wanted to remind everyone to turn off their cell phones or any device that might make noise and remind you about tonight, which is the Word Fest, the after party. So you need your badge to get in, and it starts at 7. And also to remind you that we would love to see you all there on Sunday for Contributor Day. So your talk, uh, your speaker for today is Ms. Kathy Zant. And Kathy has been leading data-driven web projects for over 20 years for companies large and small. In the last decade, she has focused on PHP, MySQL, and the WordPress platform. Her primary interest at the moment is WordPress security. Kathy works for WordFence, where she's done everything from clean hacked websites to operation management, sales, marketing, and everything in between. She is passionate about helping people and getting the most out of WordPress and the community. So please help me welcome Kathy Zane. Thank you guys. Wow. This is exciting. Is everybody having a good word camp? Yeah? Woo! All right. Okay, before I start telling you all of hacker secrets, how many actual hackers do we have in the room? Raise your hand. All right. So we... <laughs> well, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but do you call yourself a hacker? Do you consider yourself a hacker? All right, well, I'll ask you, I'll ask you at the end. <laughs> I'll ask you at the end and see where we're at, okay? All right, well, Ida just gave me a wonderful introduction, but if you want it all written down, it's on the slides, which I'll tweet out when we're all done here. Um, I've been working with WordPress for a very long time. Before that, I worked with all kinds of other technologies. Databases plus scripts are my game, and securing them is what I do now. I've done everything that you could possibly imagine at WordFence. I love the company, I love my team. Some of them are here right now. Um, if you are using WordFence on your site, give them a round of applause because they are keeping you safe and having fun here at WordCamp. Um, how did I get here? Well, anybody who's in security or has any idea about security, gets here because they got hacked. The first time I got hacked was my first job working for an insurance company in a data center in suburban Chicago. And I inherited a server that someone else set up. Someone much smarter than me, right? You know, they went to school and have a degree in computer science and they set it up. And I went to go check log files one day and there was a text file in the root of the web directory and it said, you've been hacked. 
I ran around with my hair on fire, found my bosses, incident response began. It turned into quite a bit of an incident response. They then turned to a tiger team and attacked basically the entire network because of this one text file. Um, if quite a few years later, when after I was a freelance developer, I um, set up a WordPress site for my husband, and his site got hacked. It was the Tim Thumb vulnerability. If anybody's been working with WordPress for a long time, you've probably seen a hacked site with the Tim Thumb vulnerability. Um, so I helped him clean that site. That was my first hacked WordPress site. Interestingly, on the other side of the continent, a guy named Mark Maunder also had his website hacked, and it was hacked because of the same vulnerability. Mark got busy. He got busy not only helping patch that Tim Thumb vulnerability. Um, Tim Thumb is actually an image compression library, and it's included in a lot of different themes, so it's kind of a big deal. But if you go into these files and you see Mark Maunder at the top, it means you have a safe version of Tim Thumb. Not only did Mark patch that vulnerability, he got busy writing a program that we all know and love, WordFence. And that's how it started. And now WordFence is installed on over 3 million WordPress websites worldwide, kind of a big deal. So that's how we got started. So I'm going to talk a lot about the hacker mindset, but I'm gonna pepper this with security tips that you can take home to start securing not only your WordPress site, but your life online. So tip number one, has anybody ever inherited a website from someone else? Yeah. Tip number one, never assume that that is secure. Assume that it's not. Do a, an audit on it. Uh, take a look at how everything's been set up. If you've inherited a phone from someone, a computer from someone, never uh, make the assumption that that was set up securely. Never assume anybody else knows what they're doing because you can't blame someone else for a hacked website when it's sitting on your server or a hacked server that you're responsible for or a hacked computer that has all of your financial data on it. So you have to take responsibility for security. Now cleaning hacked sites, I've talked to a few people here today and they're like, ew, that's so gross. Um, it's a mess. Uh, and it was kind of like life. There, there was a picture of Forrest Gump, but he's copyrighted. Um, so now the box of chocolates, cleaning hack sites kind of felt like uh, being Forrest Gump sitting with that box of chocolates and never knowing what you were gonna get. You'd open up uh, our ticketing system, there'd be a ticket of someone with a hacked site, you'd go take a look at what was there, and it could be anything. And no two really looked alike. You'd see some patterns, like you'd see the same vulnerabilities being attacked because of a specific campaign. But every day that I would open up a ticket and clean a hack site, and open up another ticket and clean another hack site, and sometimes clean 30 sites, because they were all in the same C panel, and every single one, was compromised, it was always a challenge. And it kind of reminded me a lot about life. Is there anyone in this room who is not challenged by something in your life right now, whether it's conflict with a spouse or a family member or someone that's sick or your dog dies and it sends you into two weeks of tears not that I've been there, but I'm lying, I've been there. We've all had challenges. Is there anyone here who doesn't have a challenge right now in their life? Anybody who's like living in a bowl of cherries? Anyone special? Because I'd like you to sprinkle that pixie dust on me if you've got it. <laughs> we all have challenges, right? This is life. Even little kids. Parents in here, remember your little kid learning how to walk, boom. How many times they fall down? And what do they do? Do they give up or do they just keep getting back up and crashing again and falling down a stair or two? Hopefully not too bad. But they keep going at it, right? There's challenges in life. And it seems like when we were born and we came into this world, we seemed to have a mindset that was prepared for these kinds of challenges, that was prepared to deal with difficulties, that was prepared to think outside of the box, that was prepared to fall down and get back up again. 
but sometimes we lose that. Now, there's a man named Viktor Frankl who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. I had to read it in college. Anybody else read it? Yeah, it was assigned to a lot of us. Um, this quote stuck with me since college. Um, Between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. Now, Viktor Frankl, he had a few challenges. Viktor Frankl was in the concentration camps. And yet, he looked at that particular challenge, which I'd say is probably worse than even my dog dying, uh, and he responded to that differently. He saw that the stimuli of that challenge didn't have to be, didn't have to lead to a negative response. He didn't have to give up. He could look at that challenge and he could rise above and beyond it. And I think that's what the hacker mindset is all about. It's about seeing challenges. It's about seeing your entire life in a different way. And it's about grasping that space between stimulus and response and choosing your freedom. All right, does that sound interesting to anyone? You want to be free? Then you got to learn how to think like a hacker. Because how you respond to your challenge is your experience. If you respond to a challenge or a difficulty and you go cry in your room for two weeks, how is that helping you? How is that helping you grow? If your little kid falls down a, set, a flight of stairs or falls down you know, when he's learning to walk and never gets back up again, where does that leave him? Life is pushing and pulling us to our greatness. It's pushing and pulling us in directions that you know sometimes we might not want to go. But those challenges are pushing us towards really finding out who we are. It starts out when we're walking. It goes through school and teachers telling you that you're not smart enough or that you have a learning disability or that you have a problem and you're never going to surmount that problem. Can you hack beyond the challenge that stands before you? Because your greatness is not going to come in a vacuum. It's going to come because you decided to go into that space between stimulus and response and choose differently. And if you're working with WordPress, you have plenty of opportunity to deal with challenges. Anybody in here whose site is under attack right now? The smart ones are raising their hands because they know. Now that screenshot that's up there is from the WordFence dashboard. We're on three million sites. We see some things. So those are the types of attacks that we're seeing. Because WordPress powers over a third of the internet, it's under attack. Hackers understand economies of scale. And they're going after the biggest fish in the pond. And if you're working with WordPress, you know why it's the biggest content management system out there. It's the most functional. It's the most easily extensible. It's where most of us are making our living. It's awesome. And hackers are looking for ways in. Thinking like a hacker and securing WordPress and securing the rest of your life is good for business. Now, this study came from AT&T. They found that companies with proactive security policies actually are more successful in business. 24% sales growth over a three-year period with 20% profit margins. Now, companies without proactive security policies only experience 6% growth with 3% profit margins. Hmm. Now, obviously, AT&T is trying to sell you security services, but they still did the research and it's still valuable. And what are they finding out? They're finding out that people who think proactively about security, huh, they have a mindset. And they're probably thinking proactively about other areas of their business as well. It's not limited to security. So security is a great place to start because you have an asset. It's your WordPress website. Securing that asset is going to help you start thinking like a hacker, and it's going to spill over into other areas of your mindset and dealing with your business as well. So let's get proactive about security. If you're using WordPress right now, you can go on wordfence.com, go to the site security audit, Google WordFence site security audit. On there, there is a sample report. 
in the back of that report is a list of everything that our trained security analysts look at when they are analyzing your site security. Now you could hire one of our guys to do it, you'll get a premium license, but you can also do it yourself. You can do it right now. Well, obviously not right now, you're at WordCamp, but tomorrow when this is all done, <laughs> you can go download that report and start proactively looking at the security of your site and it'll spill over into other areas of your life as well. Now, even if you're not dealing with WordPress, you still have an opportunity to think about security because if you don't have a WordPress site, I'm sorry to report that you are still under attack. We all are. We've all been hacked. I am willing to bet that everyone in this room has the, at least one email address in a breach. A man named Troy Hunt has a website called Have I Been Pwned? And he basically takes all of these breaches that end up in places like the dark web, the big scary dark web, and places like um, torrents and whatnot that hackers all share information on. And he takes all of this information and puts it into a database. So you can go put your email address in there and see if you've been in one of these breaches. If you've used LinkedIn, you've been in a breach. If you use Adobe or have used Adobe in the somewhat distant past, you've been in a breach. And if you have any credit cards whatsoever, there is a credit reporting agency that had a very high scale breach that uh, even if you didn't have a contract with them, your information ended out on the web for hackers to poke at. So we are all under attack. So security tip number three, go on to Have I Been Pwned, put your email addresses, all of them in there, see where your information has been in dumps, and if your email address is in there, I'm sorry to say a password might be in there. But nobody in here reuses passwords, right? Has anybody ever reused a password? Do you remember the good old days when you could do that? Oh. Yeah, I, my cats, my dog, use all my kids' names. Can't do it anymore. Those passwords are all in a breach and they're tied to your user information and hackers are using them to poke at other services, including your WordPress site, to try to get in. So, security is good for business. The hacking mindset is something that could change your life. So let's take a look at who hackers really are. Are you a hacker yet? <laughs> Getting there? Um, let's look at who hackers really are and take a look at the hacking mindset. So is the hacker this guy? You see this guy in the media all the time, right? This is the hacker, the big scary guy with the Guy Fox mask. Or maybe it's the scary guy in a dark room looking at his computer in a hoodie. He looks pretty scary. Or maybe it's the non-conformist teenage hacker girl. All right, so I'm involved in security marketing, and I hate to tell you that security stock photography, well, I, if you have a good sense of humor, go take a look at it. It is slightly ridiculous. So we have loads of fun with this. Um, but the media tries to tell us that hackers are what? Bad guys, people to be scared of someone who's trying to steal all of your information and your money. Hackers sound scary, but here's an alert. These guys, anybody know who that is? That's it, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, Apple Computer, way back in the day, actual hackers. It took some creativity to create the first personal computer. It took thinking outside of the box. It took thinking beyond what was acceptable. And these guys were actual hackers. Um, phone freaking, back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, you could play a 2600 hertz tone into a phone, and an analog phone, and you could actually get free long distance, which if you're old like me, was a big deal. I wish I knew about it, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, the funny thing is, as I was researching phone freaking, this Captain Crunch whistle made a perfect 2600 
hertz tone, you could use a Captain Crunch whistle to get free long distance. All right, now who's an actual hacker? <laughs> kids? Has anybody ever been to San Jose, to the Kids Museum there? It's, it's on Waz Way, the Kids Museum. Steve Wozniak, Waz Way. They're just a bunch of kids having fun. Remember our kids learning how to walk? Standing up after they fell? Not giving up? Hmm, we're starting to learn about the hacker mindset, aren't we? What did we lose? Hackers, like our kids, don't see different things. They see things differently. And so what I'm inspiring you to do is to look at everything in your life just a little bit differently. So normal people would see a locked door. What does a hacker see? I could pick that lock. Normal people see the way things have always been. Get stuck in our ways, don't we? Hackers see a new way of doing things better, like personal computers. Normal people see the rules and the regulations and the way it's supposed to be done because that's what the government tells you to do. Hackers see rules as things to transcend, to be bent, rules to be broken. We see vulnerabilities. Hackers see opportunity. Hackers see systems as collections of rules. This used to have the spoon kid from the Matrix, <laughs> but now we just have a bent spoon. Copyright. Um, <laughs> but do you remember the Matrix? Everybody saw that movie, right? Neo, what did Neo do at the beginning? What, did, what was his job? He was, he was a programmer and he was a hacker. He had the mindset ready to look at the Matrix in a different way. All right, I might be a little bit cliche by saying that this whole world is a system that could be hackable, but you have to look at everything in your life, not just your computer, not just your phone, not just your relationships, your mind. It's all hackable. It's all changeable. That's how we were born. We were born to look at things and feel things that we couldn't do and to think beyond that. Otherwise, we, would we run? We would have given up long ago. Innovation comes from seeing the challenges in your life. Those things that we talked about earlier where I asked if everybody's got a little bit of something they're trying to work out. Those challenges are things that you can look at differently and you can look at them differently today. You can start asking questions. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? So let's dive a little deeper into the how and why of thinking like a hacker. Does anybody remember the target breach that happened in 2013? That was a story, huh? Oh my gosh. So what happened? It was around Christmas time, Thanksgiving, and um, HVAC vendor had VPN, virtual private network, access into Target's network. Um, that computer got hacked. Heating and air conditioning computer got hacked. 19 days after they did the post-mortem on what had happened, they found that those hackers were in that system for 19 days. Was it a guy in a hoodie? Could have been. Maybe it was a group of guys from the Ukraine. Who knows who it was, but they had patience. Now, if they had gone in there and said, oh, look at Target's HVAC system. I wonder if we can turn the air conditioning on in Minnesota. Great, that's fun. But they looked at that system and they said, I wonder where we can go. Where can the rules be bent? Where can the rules be broken? They ended up 1,800 point of sale cash registers across the United States. Bing, the mother load. Patience. So security tip number four. It's a scary story. <laughs> Functionally isolate your website. Anybody use cPanel? Anybody got more than one WordPress installation in your cPanel? 
All right, so I cleaned a hack site. It was a Brazilian agency. This agency had 30 sites in a cPanel. One of their customers had a password that was in a data dump in a breach. Hacker got in, went to the 404 page theme editor, and pasted that 404 page as a PHP backdoor. That gave them access to 30 WordPress websites. They appended a JavaScript redirect into every single JavaScript file in that cPanel. That agency's customers, every single one of them, was redirecting site traffic to a bad place on the internet. So one site, one cPanel. That's our recommendation. If you're going to put more than one site in a cPanel, watch each of them carefully. Remove everything you're not using. Plugins you're not using, don't just deactivate them. Get them out of there. Themes you're not using, same thing. And if you have a test site, because you just want to test and see if a theme is going to work a certain way or a plugin is not going to cause a problem, and then you forget about that test site, still an entryway into your production site. So delete that or take care of it. Hackers are persistent. Now that's just an image that, you know, I'm sure it's been on Facebook, it's been in your feed, it's been shared 40,000 times, I think. Patience and persistence are two key traits of a hacker. Do you give up before you get to the mother load? Those target hackers didn't. What about the challenges in your life? Are you going to give up before you get to where you want to be? Patience and persistence. If you need practice, head down to the word fence table, pick a lock. It takes patience, it takes persistence, and then all of a sudden, you're thinking like a hacker. Visualize the solution, don't try to force it often helps. More security tips. So treat the problems of your life and security like games or puzzles. Oftentimes we get like emotionally attached to an outcome or we get emotionally affected by the negativity that might be the shade that's being thrown at us by an adversary. It's all just a game. If you can stay in the hacker mindset, you're going to treat it like a game and you're going to be more able to be flexible recapture that childlike exuberance that we once had in order to see solutions where other people just see problems. So look for those opportunities because those challenges really are your stepping stone to your greatness. And if you watch your site security, it's a great practice for looking at problems in other areas of life. So go pick a lock and uh, backups is in there because backups, everybody's backing up, right? All right. So scaling the attack. Is it a guy in a hoodie trying to get into sallyscatblog.com? Or is it just a bot? It's a bot. 99.99% of the bad traffic we see comes from a handful of IP addresses just trying to get into WordPress. And these are bots that are programmed. Maybe the guy's wearing a hoodie. I don't know. But it's bots. They are looking for vulnerabilities or opportunities. So you can do that too in all areas of your life. And in security, you can leverage technology to make security more effective. There are firewalls, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, malware scanning, password managers. There's all kinds of technology to help you stay secure so that you can free your mind up to think like a hacker. So look below the surface. When you're seeing a problem, you're seeing just the top of the iceberg. The solution is always a little bit deeper. It takes some curiosity. It takes asking, what if? How does this work? What's really going on here? Everything in your life is hackable. Now, no security talk would be complete without talking a little bit about ethics, right? I mean, that's what really the whole negative connotation of a hacker is all about. It's all about ethics. So are you going to put ethics first? Are you going to put money first? Because all these hackers, what they're trying to do, when they're trying to get into WordPress, they're trying to put scripts on there to direct to advertising networks or malware that's going to crypto mine, make them more money. Um, they're trying to exploit the server resources that you're paying for in order for their profit motive. But hacking, what's it all about? What's the intent behind your hacking? Are you trying to hack the world to be a better place? 
or are you trying to hack the world for your own profit and gain, like Dr. Evil? So I believe that there is such a thing as white hat hacking, and I see it all the time. So recently, a guy found a way to get past Instagram's two-factor authentication. So two-factor authentication is six-digit code, one million permeations. He basically leveraged cloud servers to rotate through IP addresses and basically brute forced past the two-factor authentication. That's pretty cool. He went to Facebook, Instagram, and showed them his proof of concept of how he got in. They gave him $30,000. Pretty sweet, huh? Hacking, ethical hacking can pay. You don't have to turn to the dark side, Luke. You can be a white hat hacker, and there's money in it. In the WordPress world, there's plenty of ethical hacking going on. And I'm going to shout out to one of my coworkers, a man by the name of Matt Berry. He's an incredible guy. Um, I don't think there's anyone on our team who doesn't look at Matt with the utmost in respect, not only technically, but just as a rock solid human being. Matt Berry is incredible. If you're here, Matt, I'm sorry. I hope I'm not making you embarrassed, but we all really expect, really, really respect you. So Matt was doing an audit of plugins that we use on WordFence.com, because we use WordPress too, of course. And he found a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability in a plugin known as Syntax Highlighter Evolved. Um, he looked to find a person to responsibly disclose this to, um, to get it fixed. And he found that um, Automatic is the maintainer of that plugin. The developer was a man by the name of Alex Mills. Um, many of us in the WordPress community knew Alex because he was such a prolific um, coder. He worked for Automatic. Um, many of my friends got into coding PHP and coding for WordPress because of Alex. Uh, so Matt got $350 bug bounty for disclosing this responsibly patch has been um, put out by Automatic. He took that $350, his profit, and he donated that in memory of Alex to the hospital that treated him. There are ethical hackers. Matt Berry is one, and I am proud to work with him. He is uh, ethical hacking really at its finest, and he's in the WordPress community. And that's one of the things that's really special about WordPress. I mean, we're all here at a WordCamp, right? And it's kind of a special place. It's, it's our tribe. There's a lot of very special people here. Um, and the hackers that exist in this room and the hackers that are out there picking locks are all some really fine people. So security tip number six, two-factor authentication. We're using it, right? Anybody not using two-factor authentication? Anyone confused what two-factor is? I'll just go over it really quickly. So you have a username, you've got a password. They're probably in a breach somewhere. That two-factor authentication code, your Google Authenticator app on your phone or Authy app on your phone or 1Password, which has it built into their system, great tools because even if they get your username and password, they're not going to get that code unless they steal your device. It's going to add an extra layer of security. and if you really want to stay secure, call your bank. Because, oh my gosh, the banking system, where we keep our money, what the heck, SMS still? Come on, you guys, get with the program. So many of our financial institutions are behind the ball with this and still using SMS-based two-factor authentication. It's kind of a sad state because there are things such as SIM porting attacks where someone can go to a, a Verizon store, for example, and say, my name's Kathy Zant, and my mom died, and my phone's not working, and I don't know him. Oh, my gosh. And put that person under pressure. And no, I don't have my ID because my mom just died, and whatever. And get a SIM card put into a new phone. Boom, they've got the SMS codes. Use the authenticator apps wherever you can because SMS will go by the wayside. So that's about it. But I have a question. I asked before if there were any hackers in this room. 
when I started. And I want to know if anybody's changed their mind. Any hackers in this room? A few more hands? Oh, come on, you guys. This is like my thing. <laughs> I'm going to hack your way out of problems now, right? You're going to look at things with fresh eyes. You're going to say, what if, and find solutions to your problems so that you can experience your greatness. And if you have any questions, I'm open for them. Follow me on all these places. Watch my podcast with my boss, Mark, at thinklikeahacker, wordfence.com slash podcast. And that's it. We have a few minutes for questions, if anyone's got them. Happy to talk about anything. Yes, my dog really did die. <laughs> I have a new dog now, though. Any questions? Yes. First thing you do, make a backup of everything. Make a backup of your log files. Make a backup of your entire site. Store that backup elsewhere. Get it off your server, because your hacker might still be on your server. Um, then I would, run, I would run a WordFence scan. Install WordFence if your site is still functional. Um, make sure you're backing up your database as well, because sometimes they get in there. And I mean, sometimes we get site cleaning requests come in, and the site might just have something wrong with it, but it's so broken, they can't figure out what's going on. But the first thing to do is to make a backup. If you have a cPanel, you can make a backup that way. If you can install a plugin to make a backup that way, you can get Jetpack, you can back up that. There's tons of ways of making that backup. Your hosting provider may help you. That way you're preserving the evidence of what's happened, and then you can start trying to clean it. Um, if you go on WordFence, or just do a search for how to clean a hacked site with WordFence, and it'll there's um, a whole tutorial on how to do that, or just how to clean a hacked site. Um, another thing that I would really recommend is going on, um, just do a search for Harden WordPress, Harden WordPress. And there is a page on WordPress.org that will give you a number of steps where you can more tightly secure WordPress. Like for example, like the Brazilian agency cPanel nightmare that I cleaned up, 30 sites. <sighs> Um, had they turned off theme editing, which is something that you can do in your WP config file, then they would have never gotten to that 404 page to paste in that back door with the theme editor. So, and, and how often are you editing your themes with that? You know, so you can just turn it off if your site's live production doesn't need to be messed with. It's just another way to harden WordPress. So Google harden WordPress. Tons of tips there. Yes. What's the most common attack vector that you see? Is it XSS, SQLI, brute force, what? Um, we did some research quite a few years ago, and it was cross-site scripting attacks. Yeah. So, okay. and it's when we see um, attacks happening, they're going after plugins. Right. For the most part, so keep your plugins updated. Don't install anything and just leave it there. If you're not using it, delete it. That kind of good plug-in hygiene will help keep you safe. But yeah, cross-site scripting. The WordFence, not that I'm selling from the stage, but the WordFence free version that you can get out of the repository, our cross-site scripting protection is pretty stellar. Awesome. Uh, one last question is, yes. uh, you mentioned one site per cPanel. Yes. So how does that apply with multi-site? Multi-site. One multi-site per <laughs> cPanel, avoid multi-site, well, Wix, no, I'm just Multi-site, okay, so we've seen intrusions with multi-site, same type of situation where you have one site with an admin, and depending on how you have things installed, I mean, we saw one intrusion happen where it was a reused password, and the, the dump that ended up in the database was domain name, you know, userguy at domainname.com was the email address with a reused password, got into the system, was not a super admin, but they had PHP exec installed. Not live, but the hacker made it live. <laughs> Pwned. So. <laughs> well played. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer anything. I'm curious, what's your opinion on um, one password for multi-factor authentication versus using something separate like uh, Duo or Authy 
Um, because one password, it's, it's very convenient, but it also feels like my password and the two-factor authentication code are in the same place. It's right there, yeah. Um, eggs all in one basket, right? That's typically, okay, so I use multiple password management tools, and I use multiple authenticator tools, and I'm all over the place, and I, I think even if, you know, I died, I don't think my husband could get into all my stuff because I'm all over the place. Um, so obfuscation, obviously, is a strategy, um, but also, uh, you know, when, when I first had that hack happen, when I worked at that, that insurance company way back in the day, they sent me to security school. And I learned one very important principle of security. The most secure system is buried in concrete six feet under. The most usable system is completely open and is gonna get hacked. Somewhere in the between all of that is the happy medium. And that happy medium is gonna be different for each person, right? I mean, every time I use two-factor authentication, I curse it, I don't like it, but I use it because I've seen some things, right? And I, I mean, my passwords are like ridiculous. So it, it, it's, it's a personal decision. Um, and I mean, if you're on a team and you have a two-factor authentication, one password is like really the only way to go. And you're using a shared system because that's what that service requires you to do. It works. Other questions? Yes, got one right here. Okay, Early, yes. Earlier in your uh, presentation, you had, you mentioned uh, intent behind the intrusion. Yeah. And when you first came onto your uh, team and you realized that your pre-built server had been hacked, yeah. they left you a convenient text file to say that you were hacked. Yeah. Most of the time, to my understanding, they don't want to be detected. Right. So with that, what do you think the intent was or why would somebody leave? Somebody oh, no. sprinkled pixie dust on my, me that day, seriously, because that was, I, I lucked out, you know. I mean, sure, I'm going to blame the person who set the server up because I didn't do it. I assumed. I made an assumption. I was a younger, younger kid, right? You know, I mean, it was my first, like, real hardcore, I'm working in a server basement job. Um, but still, take responsibility. I have to take, I learned the hard way to take responsibility. Um, white ha hacking happens, you know, and... That was a white hack hacker. I mean, what they basically accessed was a bunch of HTML files. There wasn't even WordPress back then, because I'm old. Uh, so it was, there was nothing for them to really get at, but I thank that person, because they sent me down a track of learning a lot. And uh, other than that Tim Th Thumb thing, there's no wood to knock on, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been hacked, so. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one. Okay. So uh, with static websites, you know, yeah. back in the day, you'd have one CSS file. Now with modern day WordPress websites, you might have 15 CSS files, um, a bunch of inline CSS, a bunch of CSS in the head. It's a lot going on, and it yeah. makes it really difficult for a content security policy, um, which is I'm starting to hear a lot more about. So I was just wondering, do you have any uh, opinions on you know, how valid content security policy is and good ways to implement that in WordPress? Content security policy, hmm. Uh, well, I mean, it's gonna be different for each organization, right? And you're gonna to have to take a lot of things into consideration. What's in your WordPress? Are you store, I mean, I've heard some stories and I've seen some things of what people put in their WordPress and oh my gosh, if it's personally identifiable information, don't put it in your WordPress. WordPress is not the place to store that kind of information. Um, but you're gonna have user information. Maybe you're using WooCommerce and you've got you know, your customer's information in your database. So each, each situation is gonna be, each site is gonna be so different and you're gonna have to look at that differently. With the static sites, um, and, and there seems to be you know, sort of this move towards headless WordPress and static sites sitting in front of WordPress. Um, talking to WordPress behind the scenes and things like that. Um, I, I'm watching all of that with interest because I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. I don't think it's the right solution for everyone, especially right now. Um, but it's, it's going to be interesting. I, I'm curious because, you know what, when I first started coding, there was no SQL injection. <laughs> 
It wasn't a thing. I remember when sequel injection, that's how old I am. I saw sequel injection come on the scene and had to go like sanitize all my inputs and then, yeah, I'm old. My friends and my coworkers are laughing at me right now. But yeah, SQL injection wasn't always a thing. And there's security things that are going to happen five, six, seven, eight years from now that we are going to laugh at that we aren't doing now. So um, each site's going to be different. You have to stay on top of security. Uh, we love to do that for the WordPress community. We've got your back. Subscribe to our newsletter. If we know that something's happening, we're going to let you know, and we're going to have your back. I have four seconds, so I think I'm done. If you have more questions, I'll be at the WordFence booth, and I'm happy to answer anything there. So go think like a hacker. Have fun. Thank you.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know it is the last session, but shake it off. I'm telling you, you're gonna be so glad that you came here today. My name is Aida, and before I introduce you to this lovely lady whom I consider a friend, I just wanna go over a few things. Um, if you have your cell phones or any devices that make any noise, we ask that you silence them now. Um, also, don't forget tonight is the Word Fest. 
our version of the after party. It is at 7 o'clock at um, City Museum. You need to have your badge in order to attend, so make sure that you have that with you. And don't forget that Contributor Day is on Sunday, and we're hoping that we will see all, if not most, of you there. So this lovely lady here is Tracy Apps. Um, her bio says, behind the bow tie, Tracy Apps at TAPS is a big picture doer, a developer, a designer, a translator, a UX creator. For Tracy, UX is so much more than being than making pretty buttons. With over 20 years of well, web development experience, including work with Fortune 500 companies, Tracy's curiosity and love of problem solving has led her into many amazing opportunities. She has taught web development, design, and UX at, at several universities, including UW-Milwaukee, her alma mater, and is national, a nationally known and renowned public speaker. Most recently, Tracy has co-launched a podcast, Women in WP. Tracy is a drummer, bow tie aficionado, obviously, and she could probably deadlift you if you give her the opportunity. <laughs> and I had the opportunity of spending some time with her in Costa Rica where we were both speakers and get to know her as a person, but I got to sit in on her talk and it is amazing, so you're in for a treat. Tracy Apps. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Welcome. All right. So, yeah, this is a long title. Is something not very usable or accessible? Then change it. Let's start here. Uh, does this look familiar to anyone? I, well, I mean, you're at a WordCamp. You're at WordCamp US. So, you probably see this a lot. Uh, but do you, have you ever done work for clients and they kind of seem a little lost? They don't really know what to do? Well, the cool thing is we can change it. How about this? Our new editor. Um, you know, for some, this, this might be super easy and straightforward to understand. It's very clean. For me, I found myself clicking all over the place trying to figure out where the buttons were because I just saw them there. And so for me, it, was, it started to be really frustrating. And wait, I have actual video of me using this here. Uh, there, so we got the, it's a French cooking show. Um, so yeah, well, I labeled this here. So you see me, and then all of a sudden, like, where's the interface buttons? Oh, there they are, okay. So, <laughs> Yeah, poor cat. So it's an adjustment. It's something new. Uh, but the great news is that we can change that. Um, because WordPress is open source. Um, and we have this power to change things, which is one of the big reasons why I continue working with WordPress in my daily life and in, in my work. So, if you know any user experience designers, you'll know our favorite word is why. But why change it? Uh, I had some frustrating times with the, with the change, the new interfaces, um, but I have a lot of history. I have been using WordPress, well, my first blog was on B2, which was the code base that eventually was forked to become WordPress. So I've been doing this for so long, so I have my own biases, and I've developed my own habits, good or bad, uh, but, and I'm used to things a certain way. So when I'm frustrated, it might just be a me problem and not the software problem. Uh, so it's hard for me to take a step back and have a neutral view of what I'm testing or looking at. So instead of just making assumptions, I decided to run a very simple usability test with just a couple people that don't have that same history, that same experience with WordPress. Because, you know, I just end up being the old man that, that yells at a cloud, and I don't want to just be that, so we'll do an actual test. So we did this really simple thing. Five tasks, about a dozen questions, and only like a, a handful of people. 
one thing, a lot of people say, well, I can't do usability testing because I don't have all the fancy tools. Well, it doesn't require all, all of this technology and all of this time and budget. It can be done simply. I did this on my laptop. How, you ask? Well, I am glad you asked. So here's what I did. I installed a local environment. You can use whatever tools you use so that I could have an, an, just a simple, plain, no customization, no extra plugins, plain vanilla WordPress install on my computer and made a test account. And set it up with the things that I wanted to test. So, you know, put in some, some test content of things that I wanted to, to, to test on people. Um, I create a script, um, and I print out my copy, which has the tasks as well as the follow-up questions. And then I print up a smaller version with just the tasks for the user to read along with or also refer to you know, while they're doing the task if they need to refresh it so they can look at that. And then also we just have a consent form. There's um, a bunch of different templates over at uh, usability.gov. Lots of great resources there for uh, usability and such. So I highly recommend that. But you don't have to write it from scratch. You can use one of the templates there. Now, when it came to the script, there was a couple things that you have to keep in mind. One, the questions need to be written in a very neutral way, nothing leading. And then also, I say, leave some time in your schedule for that test, for that session, for questions that aren't on your script that are follow-up questions. Uh, respond to and ask deeper questions of the things that they are doing or experiencing or struggling with. Now, these tests work best with very simple, actionable, you know, um, understand, like very simple tasks. And so these big tasks, big complex tasks, can be broken down into smaller tasks and then have follow-up questions within them. And we got to include some instructions. So at the beginning, first outlining the goals, like what are we doing here, um, and some limitations. Because a lot of times when we're testing something, it's something that's in production, so it might not work completely. It might be a prototype or even wireframes, you know, so letting people know that not everything is gonna work and the content is all placeholder text about cats, just to prepare for that uh, so that they don't focus on those things. Um, reminding people to think out loud and just a narration of everything they are thinking and doing and why am I clicking on this. It's hard, but you just, you know, just pretend like you're talking to yourself throughout this whole process and remind them to do that. And the big part is, th this isn't a user test. We're not testing the user uh, or the abilities of the user. We are testing the software, the product, the website. So there is no way of failing and actually, when a user or a participant in these tests cannot achieve the task, that gives us just as much information, or even more, very valuable data, that, well, that needs to change. And we can see where the problem points are. And that is really gold for being able to make these things better and change them. All right. Then I used, there's a, just a, uh, built-in screen recording software on my Mac, and then I used QuickTime or, or whatever other video program, and I set up my webcam, and so I recorded the screen, and then from the video, the audio and visual of the person as they were going through the test, and reminding them, this isn't something that I'm gonna publish, it's just for me to review later. So, I like to record the video because I don't, you, I get the best results when they feel comfortable. And I don't know about you, but I can't feel very comfortable if there is someone right here, 
right behind me or right in front of me asking me questions and now do this thing. And I'm like, eee. okay. So then I can sit further back and then review the video later. Because one of the big things we know about communication is that really only 7% is the actual words that we use. There's like 38%, which is the tone, the tempo, the volume. And the biggest part is the physical, facial expressions, gestures, posture. So just hearing even just an audio recording is not even going to give us the full picture of what that person is communicating through all of these pieces. And now here, the biggest, most difficult part of it is to not interrupt, to just observe, and leaving an awkward amount of silence and then leaving some more. For some people, like myself, I internalize and I process things, and I don't always, if, if I'm not given that opportunity or I feel like I'm being rushed or I'm being interrupted, I'm not gonna give a complete answer because I'm still processing it. So by leaving that space there, asking a question, asking them to do a task, and then silence, and then count another 10 seconds. Because sometimes now, oh, I thought of something now. I processed that. So what did I find out? Well, there were some of these things. I went into this test with some assumptions. And so those are the things that I wanted to test. And so I, a lot of these things that I found aligned with that, which was great. But there were other things that I did not even expect to find. So for example, this icon at the top here, that pencil icon, what does that mean? For me, it means edit. I see it in all these interfaces that say, oh yeah, well that's the edit button. But every single one of my participants struggled with that. Even one said, oh yeah, that's where to write text. So here it's saying, I'm gonna edit this photo, but they were like, oh, but that's where to write text, so it, it doesn't compute. Well, it makes sense. They were a writer. They use a pencil to write. What else? Our lovely dashboard. I saw some, uh, some fun patterns. I asked, what is the first thing you see? Well, I see this yellow thing here. I don't know what D-I-V-I -I means, but I see the word tavern here a couple times, so that's cool. And I don't know what these boxes are for. It really boils down to, it doesn't matter how long you have been interneting, the struggle's real. You can be from zero years to 20, 30 years. Uh, we all struggle with these things. And it's hard because there's a lot of things that we assume as universal that are not. But remember, we can uh, change these things because, and there's a lot of kind of different options on this. So, but where do we start? We'll start with the dashboard. So. Like I said, I saw some key themes from the test results. One, that the hierarchy was not clear. When they logged in, they didn't know what to look at first or what actions to take, what was most important. There was information that wasn't relevant to them and even language that, or words that they didn't understand or had a different understanding of them. And then extra space was more confusing than it was helpful. So again, the whole premise of this talk is we can change things. And then we have some options. So one way, we can change things with plugins. So I asked on Twitter for some recommendations of people that make sites for clients in particular. 
And I got a whole bunch of responses. And this is just a fraction of what is out there. So I won't go into what each plugin does or which one is better because it all is relative to what the end goal is. How much you want to modify, how you want to modify is all dependent on the, the application. Like, who is this for? So after just playing around with a couple, which I recommend if you have just you know, five, 10 minutes to spare, just play around with them and see what kind of options you have, especially if you do work for clients. So I just played around a little bit and I made this. I mean, it's not perfect, but I'm addressing some of the main concerns like the hierarchy. So what do I do now here? Well, this client only needs to really write a blog post. So right there, right off the, right off the bat, I've got a big old button for them to click on to write a new post. Um, and then you can do like a customized widget. So in this case, let's say I make uh, video tutorials for them, or I subscribe to a video tutorial site. There's many really great ones out there. And there's one video or two videos in particular that really apply to them. Well, then I can write a, I can include a link directly to those videos. Uh, oh, we talked about places to get stock photography. Here are those links. Oh, and here is my email address or how to contact me in case if you have any other questions. So, I mean, I think that's a bit of an improvement. So, self five, okay, moving right along. Now let's move to our post editor, our new blocks. So, what's good here? Well, it's very clean. It's very clean uh, that the vertical rhythm or the spacing, it just feels nice. Uh, it's well designed, really good typography, and you know, clear, right? Well, what is not as good? I'm not gonna say anything's bad, because again, it's all relative, but things that could be improved on. So one of the things that things are hidden so when I'm going around and clicking on things and I can't figure out where that button was, I just saw it there, uh, I, they're all hidden. And hiding things is not really great for accessibility, but also, let's say if I had that, uh, that settings panel where they had the kind of more actions in there, I had that hidden. If I am not a person that has, well, no, no major limitations and mobility, and can actually move a mouse with some precision, and I'm the type of person that would see this and I think, oh, I'm gonna mouse around and see. I could think that this is just my website. I don't, I, if I miss the buttons at the top and I don't know what the things on the side is, so I just ignore that, it just looks like I'm reading Hello World. And the one thing I do with uh, user experience design is you want to make sure that the thing that the people need to do, you want to make it easy for them to be able to do that thing. So never sacrificing functionality and accessibility for the sake of design is very important. So it's also really good. I have one block selected and there's a really clear focus. It's a good contrast between, so I can see very clearly that I am editing this one, not the other ones that are behind it. Uh, that is really, I, really good. Um, but the problem is also because of this, uh, how the vertical spacing is, there's also this, op this opportunity for it to overlap and completely cover up. This one completely covers up the block above it. So that can feel kind of, uh, frustrating. I love this about the blocks, is you can reorder them. And I think that saves so much time, especially for someone that doesn't write very well, and then I was like, oh, I want to reorder everything. I can just move the blocks around. That's a great thing. The issue that I found was that those handles, the move handles, only show up when you mouse over it or tab directly to them. 
So if I don't know that they were there, and most of the participants um, never found those because they didn't understand what the dots were and arrows were, um, so it, it's not very, very clear. And so those are hidden even when I have that block activated. So remember the talk, our talk is we can change it. Well, this, let's look at what we can do with just some little bit of code, with a little bit of CSS. So that is one of my favorite things that WordPress has, is not only can we modify the front end, the public facing portion of the site, but we can make editor style sheets or style sheets that edit and change how the administration area functions and looks. And just as a disclaimer, I remember I'm a designer by trade and by education. So the code, I will show you some code. It's probably not really great. It's more of a for inspiration than instruction. So please don't take it verbatim. But this is just some of the things that I was playing around with some code to see how I could fix some of the things that were frustrating me or that I saw my uh, users like stumble upon. So let's dive in. All right. First off, um, I just have, I made a style sheet just for the blocks. So it's not going to, so I can just call that one in um, into that admin area and make changes just in that, keeps it simple and uh, clean in my own code. So let's look at each of these independently. So this first one, the things are hidden. All right. So why don't we just add a simple border around it? So I added just a line of code to add a single pixel solid border that's semi-transparent on all of the blocks. And then making sure that we still keep that contrast within the focus um, because, you know, so making that a little bit thicker and a different color, that kind of thing. And while we're at it, those add, a, or insert a block, those little plus signs between the blocks, I, I kept randomly finding them and then forgetting it, like it was really hard. So let's make those visible all the time too because that's a function that I think is kind of important that I want to be able to access pretty easily and know where it is. So let's look at what that is. So I've got the borders. I can see where my blocks start and stop. I can kind of see the, you know, all of the, the, the insert blocks. All right, I think we're, we're making some progress here. All right, next thing, this overlapping. Go back into our code and simply adding some margins, top and bottom, and then taking those uh, insert block buttons and kind of adjusting where they show vertically on the page between the blocks. And now we have this. Now, I'm sacrificing the really nice feel of that vertical rhythm, so it's going to be more scrolling. It's not as compact and designery, but for me, this will serve my purpose much better because then I'm not guessing where I need to click or drag. Um, so I don't mind the extra scrolling in my editing. So this to me feels much better. All right, what's next? We have the that only visible unhover the the reorder because I think that's a pretty important. Uh, function, so I want to make that visible, at least when I have that block active. So, go back to the code, and I literally just added opacity 1 to make it uh, solid instead of opacity 0 or whatever it was, this block mover, right? And now we have this. So, and this feels better to me. I know I can see, like I have that block, I can see I can move it, I can see my controls, I can easily click from there to any other block, uh, and it just, just with a few lines of code. 
I'm pretty happy with this. So, uh, I don't know. I think so. Brent does too. Finally, we talk about community. Uh, there may not be an I in team, but there is in collaboration and community, uh, which is very, ac very applicable because we have, if we don't have all of us show up at the community, then the community is not complete. So, right, this is open source. So we can all contribute, because open source is powered by all of us, right? Well, kinda. It's, it's um, powered by those with the privilege to do so, um, especially in ways that we traditionally recognize someone as a core contributor, uh, submitting code, fixing bugs those kinds of things. Because um, that does require this privilege of either, you know, any of these resources, uh, technology, having the equipment to be able to run the very large code base that is the Gutenberg blocks in development mode. Um, having even access to the information or know where to find out how to contribute. Uh, having that support or network around you and time, for example. I mean, how many people can donate time for free when we have to pay bills? So it kind of these limitations create kind of a, a pattern. Now, don't get me wrong. I think, in my opinion, the WordPress community is one of the most diverse and inclusive communities in the tech industry that I have ever seen. It's not as reflected as I would like to see when it comes to core creators and contributors. Who creates, who decides, who controls, uh, who has that ability to be at that table uh, and add their, add their expertise. And this really might make, we might have to change our mindset a bit. So I don't contribute to core, but because I, I don't see where I fit there. There's a lot of people that feel that same way, and we have great ideas. We really want to contribute, but we don't know how to because we don't have those privileges to be able to spend time on a Slack meeting during the daytime hours or something. Any of the, the kind of available opportunities are hard for some people. So, you know, what if we more open sourced the way we open source? Thinking through other ways of having people contribute, I think is really important. You know, having a, right within the admin area, a suggestion box, and then that can go, or town halls where people can raise their concerns. Uh, in user experience, we do these workshops, these design workshops to figure out what the problem is and all of these things and figure out the why and how the best way to solve that. Well, what if we had some more of a, an online virtual that, uh, workshop that wasn't tied to a certain time zone, uh, but was open and anyone can contribute to it? Or let's say I have an idea, but I don't have the ability to, to follow through with it. Is there a way we can have like a tag team and now, but I can take that and I have the ability to use that and run with it. Or mentorship programs. What a better way to intentionally grow our core contributing community than by intentionally inviting others to like, train, to help with design, development, strategy, whatever it is, bringing more people and more voices and more diversity to the table only makes us better, makes the product better, makes WordPress better. And just because I'm on this side of the podium doesn't mean that anything I say or any of my ideas are more important 
are more relevant, even more good. So I want to hear from everyone. If you go on Twitter, I'm just, you know, we can tweet with this hashtag because this isn't being used. Change it WP. Have any ideas of ways that we can not only improve, we can improve how WordPress is, but also improve the way we improve WordPress. Some new processes that we can, uh, we can follow to really bring more people to the table who don't have check all of the, the boxes that I can and donate this time or these different privileges. So we can have this lower barrier to entry to really include more people within this. I think it's really important. And it's good, one thing to note is that change is something that's always going to be changing, right? It's a journey. We're not gonna like have a destination and we're gonna just nail it. It's gonna be perfect. We are growing, technology is growing and changing. So we do like what, we learn something, we grow, we change. We learn something else, we learn, we grow, we change. We learn something new, learn, grow, change. As long as the software and the things that we create follow that same pattern, that is good. And it only gets better when we all have a say in this. So I think that this is really key is, no, we're not going to get it perfectly, but we're going to do better. And then we're going to do a little bit better. And then we're going to do a little bit better. I think we can do that. Thank you. We have some time. Anyone have any questions? Or ideas? Bring them too. Yeah. Sorry, I could. I could he's coming with a microphone. <laughs> I don't have specific ideas, but do you have specific ideas about how we make this more um, open to everyone? Mm -hmm. Those barriers are, I mean, they're real barriers. So how do, we, how do we break that? And how do we protect those new people from um, the clannishness that might mm -hmm. occur? Yeah, one of the big things is that change of mindset of what is valued. Because if I come with like a sketch on a napkin um, versus I come with um, code, a, a, a code to fix a bug, uh, that code that fixes that bug is really valued as a valuable and you, know, you are a core contributor. But if I bring an idea that like, I'm not a designer, I'm not a developer, but I think this would really help. Uh, having that ability and that space to be able to do that, whatever that looks like, and that I don't know. If is it, is it something, it's got something online, something that's not, that I have to be at something at a certain time because what if I can't during that time? So something more open that way. So brainstorming some ways that we can do this, that it does not require us to be online at a certain time, uh, but we can still have that conversation go and that it's just known that everything that people contribute is as much value as the other thing is a big mindset shift, shift on that. Anyone else? Learn more about the, like the, results the results of the Gutenberg. Did they uh, do all the kitties? Did they, were they able to add all the cats in successful yeah. manner? <laughs> so I'll tell you, what I did is the, um, I, the tasks were pretty simple. One was just like, um, find where you can create a post and then make something. You know, it was more of a, uh, what, what do you think you can do on this page? And because it was really plain and simple, um, I got the comments of like, well, it doesn't look like it can do much here. Um, and then one of the things that I saw 
is a lot of people want to, when they want to create space, they just hit return a lot, and it creates a new block every single time. Every single time, I just see block, 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 block. And then they just like delete, 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 delete. And everyone, when they wanted to uh, move something, they tried to highlight and drag like the whole block, and so it just highlighted, and then whatever. Um, I also tested my mom with this, which was really fun. She kept right-clicking and say, open image in new tab, because she wanted to edit that image. So it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, well, I hadn't really thought about that. That's, you know, it's really interesting. So the, the hardest things, and I had another task was just to replace an image. That, was, that one was really hard for a lot of people because that uh, each is, is an icon, and it's just an icon. And there's no one right off the bat hovered over something long enough for that tool tip to show up. So they all just kind of were like, mm, I don't know what that means, I don't know what that means, I don't know what it means. And I saw this, it was going across all of it because with the image block, you have like the alignment and then you have the edit button and then, I don't know, something, there's also like the change to another thing, right? And I saw go, all right, alignment left, line right, center, full, skipped right over the edit button, and then something else, whatever, and no one got that edit button, because it's not a universally understood thing. So, um, yeah, it was just fascinating. I would, yeah, anyway, yes. Uh, so it seems like an actionable item would be to add a text label to the edit pencil. Yes. Actually, honestly, there should be an option I think there should be an option to be able to have, just like with um, Microsoft Word does this. I want to see all of the icons on, the, on my menu. I want to see icons and text. I just want to see text. Sure, it's going to take up more space and it's going to be, but usability is, should not be sacrificed for design. So, yes, never, it's never good an, a good idea to use an icon only because it isn't universally understood. No matter how much we think it is and how, well, it's used very often, it's probably understood differently by different people, so. Any other questions? Y'all wanna get to the after party, right? Well, thank you for sticking out with me to the last session. I will be around, thank you.